intro. Alright, welcome back to the 24th episode of The Cycle 365. We're recording on March 11th, 2020. I'm one of your co-hosts, Simon Villanos. I'm Cody Stoffer. And I'm Jesse Booth. And we're here to talk about XFL. Is it week six? Uh, no, five. five. Then, Sorry. Well, we will talk about week six. Yeah. But five is what happened this last week. Yeah. So we're going to talk about week five of the XFL. Uh, you know, we're just going to go down the line like usual. Jesse, do you want to take it away? Oh, yes. So the first game of the weekend was the Seattle Dragons at the Houston Roughnecks mm-hmm. in, in Houston. Seattle started off really fast. You know, I I really thought that they had a chance to win the game, but P.J. Walker did his thing at the end of it. He did. Yeah. Uh, in my opinion, P.J. Walker didn't even really play that clean of a game, or as clean as it could have been. You know what I mean? Like, we kind of knew what, what it was going to be like going in. And, I mean, you know, I think... I think they're just better. You know, Seattle had to adjust to having a new quarterback and B.J. Daniels in there. And I don't know if y'all knew this, but Brandon Silvers was not at the game because he decided to just not show up. So they did not have a backup quarterback. Their emergency quarterback would have been Keenan Reynolds. And if I'm being honest, that says that says a lot more about Brandon Silvers. Like, I mean, this is... Well, okay, I'm not even going to say it's rumors because it's coming from his teammates themselves, but they're saying that he parties way too much in Seattle and he was real complacent as a starter. And, you know, it, and it showed because he would show flashes and then he'd he'd look extremely terrible right after that. And so, if I'm being honest, his pro career is over as far as I'm concerned. Well, when we talked, me and Cody talked about Keenan Reynolds last week as being an option <coughs> quarterback for the Dragons. Yep. Yeah. Um, Maybe we start looking into it a little bit more. I can't believe Brandon Silver's played the whole season hungover. Yeah, probably something like that. Um, I, I wouldn't like. I kind of like Keenan Reynolds over there. You know, B.J. Daniels didn't play bad. I think it's just more one of those things where he needs to get like into his rhythm. You know, he did run for two touchdowns. Yeah, he did. I mean, Seattle did a lot of things right this game. I, they kept P.J. Walker in the pocket. Which, I mean, that still eventually worked, you know, because P.J. Walker can throw just as well as he can run. But we said that that's part of the blueprint for at least competing with the Roughnecks is you can't let P.J. Walker run around because then he'll just kill you in every way possible. But the Seattle defense, we've talked about it all year, they're really not the problem. They made great plays all day against P.J. Walker, forcing turnovers, pass deflections. They were baiting him constantly, and... They kept the pressure on him, too. Yeah. And I just, they have to, you know, at at this point, with it being B.J. Daniels' team, it's up to him and wherever the running game is for the Dragons to figure it out at this point. Yeah. I mean, they had, they had a lot of, they had three rushing touchdowns in this game. Yeah. But they only had, they didn't have over 100 yards rushing. So when we talk about, again, we talk about the whole season so far, that they need to figure out a running game. They did have rushing touchdowns, but not a lot of rushing yards, so they still need to get the running game going. They need to get down the field. Yeah. Because I've, a lot of those setups are for, for like, the touchdowns are off of turnovers, too. Mm-hmm. Or, like, just good field position. Yeah, well, so. I mean, Seattle's defense, I believe, did score a touchdown, so... Th- they did score a touchdown, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, their defense is doing their part. They just need to figure out the offense still. Yeah. Oh, wait, no, no, no. He fell at the one-yard line. There was another one earlier that I scored on. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. But no, I agree. I mean, it will just take time, and I think there is time, especially with, you know, Dallas being in the state uh, they are in right now. And, I mean, honestly, it's it's pretty open. They're, they still have a chance if they were to play the Wildcats again and beat them. They'd be sitting good. You know, they just got to start winning games now. We're halfway through the season. You know, but it's the door isn't closed just yet. And the XFL is, I wouldn't say unpredictable I'd say it's more even and so teams will you know be as good as they will be you know as the season goes on and there'll be you know there's there's gonna be natural ups and downs it's gonna happen you know some teams will get better as time goes on some teams will uh, kind of show their true colors and you know Seattle I th- still think it's a little bit too early to tell I got a question for you guys okay so we're halfway through the season Seattle is one and four 
Yep. Is Jim Soren's seat getting hot? The uh, head coach of Seattle. Yeah, I yeah. agree with Simon. I just don't think we've seen enough yet. I, I just think it's still too early. I don't think it's super hot right now. I think it's getting a little bit warmer, but... I mean, the people of Seattle like him. And so that's a big deal because I there would definitely be a, a lot more backlash than most people would think if he was to get fired after one season. Um, and that kind of goes for most XFL coaches, too, to be honest. So I think he hasn't coached terribly. You know, there's still flashes. There are some highlights every now and then. Defense has been playing great, too. So they're competitive. It's not like they're getting whooped and, like, blown out, and they're completely, you know, like, not, you know, supposed to be in this league. But, yeah, I think I think they're okay for now. We're only halfway through. There's, there's plenty of games uh, potentially to play. I do realize that we didn't inform our listeners on the final score. Houston did win 32-23. Oh. Yeah, um, Houston won, by yes, the way. Yes, they did. They, but they they needed a, a second half comeback to, to do that. And they got it. And they got it. And P.J. Walker. They did. Their defense also clutched the game by forcing a fumble basically at the two-minute mark. On. Yeah. It was more of just B.J. Dana's dropping the ball, but... I mean, it was yeah. still some pressure, though. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah. All right, let's move on to the... Um, well, wait. Well, I'm saying move on to talking about the ref next now. Well, there was some controversy in this game. There was though. at the end. Yeah. And I, I mean, yeah, yeah, let's let's talk about that real quick because this is something the NFL pretty much never does. Uh, the XFL took, in my opinion, they made a really good business move. And they apologized for uh, this controversy and they took responsibility. So, I mean, this is more on the roughnecks than anything. But well, PJ Walker definitely took a knee on fourth down, leaving two seconds on the clock. Um, and. The Dragon should have got the ball back, and they only had to go like 20-something yards or something like that to score. And, you know, it was a one-score game and all that, but by the po- time the refs and the officials all realized this, you know, the players are on the fields, coaches were shaking hands, a lot of them were in the locker rooms, the fans were leaving the stadium, so, like, it really wasn't that worth it to, like, reverse all of that and then come back to it. Plus, no one was really that outraged initially because I don't think anybody really, like... Like, I, it just collectively slipped everyone's mind, but they apologized on it. And, you know, I think this says a lot about the XFL, but they did reassign, as in probably fire, the person who made that mistake. And I think that's a really good look for the XFL because I can't think of the last time the NFL took, uh, you know, took responsibility over a refereeing error and actually did something significant about it. Yeah. I, I agree with you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Me and Cody were talking about it. I mean, yes. It would have been good to give Seattle that one last chance, but me and Cody both agreed it was pretty unlikely that anything was going to happen. Yeah, I mean, it's unlikely, but, you know, it. if I'm being honest, like, this doesn't really hurt the fans as much because I'm sure they still had a great experience. It probably hurts the XFL a little bit more because there's still a possibility that, you know, they could have came back and then got the three-point conversion, and that that would have been something that you would that you definitely wouldn't have seen in the NFL and it would have been a first for the would XFL as well. That have been the well. first overtime game for yeah. the XFL. Yeah. If if that sequence happened. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so that would have waiting for that. Yeah, yeah. And that would have boosted popularity for sure. You know, because mm-hmm. you get to see overtime rules as well and then it's a crazy ending and whatnot. And I mean, I think the XFL realizes this too, which is why they're probably taking it way more serious than the NFL ever would, but uh, yeah, I mean, it was unlikely, but it would have been something cool to see. You know, just it's just the possibility. That possibility not being there is what matters. Yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. But, yeah, all right, we can move on now, though. All right, I'm just going to give... We can move on to the next game, but I'm just going to give you a quick overview of what the refs next did, because kind of touched on it a little bit, but not... So, like, P.J. Walker did look more like an XFL quarterback in this game. He made a few bad decisions, threw the ball right to a Dragons player. Um, he looked like an XFL quarterback. I would say he he definitely took it. I wouldn't take a step. I wouldn't say a step back. He just had an off day, but even his off day is still pretty good. His off day yeah. is still in the upper half of the league. Yeah. Um, they had a pretty good running running sh- uh, like showing for the running backs. Both running backs had 50, 50 yards. So they had over hundred rushing yards and two touchdowns on the ground. And then Cam Phillips, after getting locked down by uh, your Dallas Renegades. Yeah. Last week, he bounced back and had a monster game, 10 interceptions for 122 yards and two touchdowns. 
Yeah. Good solve Swiss back. That's basically it. Yeah. You guys move on to the next game? Yeah, let's yeah. move on. Alright, so the second game of the week was also on Saturday, Saturday afternoon. The uh, New York Guardians at the Dallas Renegades. Mm -hmm. Simon, why are the Renegades throwing the ball so much with their backup? I think they need to because, I mean, you're going to not, you're not, even if you have two good running backs, you're not going to get anything productive if you don't show that you could at least, you know, be a threat downfield. And... I mean, you know, Landry Jones is probably out for most of the season. If he tries to rush it back, then he'll probably get hurt even sooner. So I think it's time that, you know, I mean, why not? <laughs> like, everyone kind of expects Dallas to lose anyways, like, the rest of their games, to be honest. So I think it's worth, you know, just seeing what would happen uh, going vertical and, yeah, working working uh, Philip Nelson through do whatever he needs to work through. At this point, the season really doesn't matter that much. Yeah, so the Renegades lost 30-12. to 12 yeah. yeah, they got smacked. To the Guardians. They even had a kickoff return for touchdown, and it didn't help. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, I mean, you said that you think the season's lost. Don't you think, Jesse and I talked about it last week, we think the Renegades should make a move for a quarterback. I feel like, we feel like all the other pieces are there. Absolutely. Yeah. Like there, there are still people that had a good game, and we, like we've talked about, they have two good running backs. But you know, it's hard to run the ball if the other team's just going to put eight in the box because they don't believe in your quarterback. Yeah. So, I don't. You you listened to our podcast last week. Yeah. What What do you think about Jesse and I's proposal for a move for a quarterback? I mean, yeah, I'd love a move for a quarterback, but I don't think any XFL team is willing to make a trade with Dallas. Because they all know that once we get a quarterback, like we'll be a contender for sure. I do believe this team is a pretty complete team. Um, ironically, it reminds me of my Steelers not having a quarterback, but having a great defense, some good weapons on offense for sure. So I think, I mean, you know, when there are as few teams in the XFL as there is, like let's be real, only four teams make it into the playoffs. Mm -hmm. And then obviously only one person wins the championship, so there's that. And... Yeah, I just I don't think anybody's gonna trade Dallas or give Dallas even a competent quarterback. I'd say. Okay, well there are still some free agent quarterbacks that they could go after as well. Yep, but that's on them. Like, I mean, you know, free agent quarterbacks coming to the XFL, I. That's I mean that's more them than us. Like I'm sure we're looking and we're open to bring in uh, quarterbacks and whatnot, but like obviously they'll have to want to learn our system, right? What Which if the Renegades signed Tom Brady? No. <laughs> no. I, no, definitely not. But That's funny. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I just, I don't think we're, I think it's a good idea, but I don't think it's going to happen. It's pretty, I think it's still too early for uh, NFL free agents to just sign with the XFL like that. Well, I'm talking about there's XFL free agents that, I mean, like, yeah. Vinny Testaverde Jr. is out there. Like a guy like that, you could go get him and try him out. I mean, I don't know how good he is compared to Philip Nelson. I know, but because I mean, there's a reason he didn't make the Viper squad, even though he was drafted. Yeah, he, so he did went and played in the or the CFL as well this year. I know. Um, he's a starter wherever he played. I don't remember what team he played for, but he was a starter wherever he went. So I mean, maybe bring him in, give him a shot. I don't know. Or just even like competition behind Philip Nelson might make Nelson play better as well. Honestly. Knowing that somebody could take his job. You know, just getting Vinny Tesferde Jr. just behind Philip Nelson so that he feels like the pressure of someone behind him who could take his job might make him play better. No, yeah, I mean, I I want to believe that, but I know Philip Nelson is a young guy. So, like, bringing in another, you know, younger guy or talented guy to challenge him might... <laughs> might induce some mental breakdown for a young quarterback like that who's not as talented. Uh, at least that's how I see it. And I think Bob Stoops and his coaching staff, they're very old school. And that's kind of how they see it as well. You know, like they don't want to, they'd rather sit with what they have now than, you know, take a risk, roll the dice. Because if I'm being honest, um, the Dallas Renegades in the preseason, or I, I guess the offseason had a pretty solid, you know, fan base and whatnot, and I'm sure they still do, 
But not winning a game at home is really hurting, uh, I'd say, the popularity of the Renegades in Dallas. Like, it's it's getting pretty close to being... If I'm being honest, this is just the vibe I'm picking up. But it's getting pretty close to being as unimportant as a lot of high school games. Like, I'm pretty sure most people would watch spring high school 7-on-7 seven -seven football games in the Renegades at this point. So that's that's hurting them. And I would not be surprised if uh, the Renegades were to move either, because it could happen, so. See, well, we'll have to see where this Renegades team goes in the future. Yeah. But on the flip side, the Guardians. The Guardians looked good. Yeah, Luis Perez. Cody was telling me he looks like he's on another level. Yeah. Tell us, tell us about that. I mean, it's just some of the passes that Luis Perez was making, you know, they were really exact passes, and his timing and his anticipation is really good with his receivers. I mean, he has really good chemistry, and I feel like that's just a lot of that's the experience from playing in the AEF, you know, about playing with these semi-pro receivers and stuff. Yeah. And, you know, like, there is one pass that it was it went for a touchdown where – if you look at the way the ball comes out, it's because his arm got hit. So, like, even though his arm's getting hit, he still delivered an absolute dime in between two defenders yeah. to his receiver. Colby Pearson. Who ended up scoring on the play. Mm -hmm. So, Prez was the difference between the Scottie team being good versus bad. And yeah. they're starting to get a run game going, and the defense is playing out of its rocker. And I think they feed off of the energy of the offense, honestly. Yes. Yes, the defense yep. is playing very well. Um, I was going to touch on that. And I think, yeah, I think these two receivers that he has, that Luis Perez has to throw to in uh, Mikhail McKay and Peterson, or Pearson, sorry. If I'm being honest, I still don't think Kevin Gilbride, uh, the Guardians head coach, is that good of a leader. I think he's being carried by Luis Perez more than anything right now, to be honest. And, I mean, this is something we all kind of saw coming. You know, his receivers and his core around him wasn't terrible. You know, Mikael McKay was somebody that I was looking forward to having a fantastic season. But it was obvious that Matt McGoin wasn't going to give him the looks or touches that, you know, someone as talented as him should be getting. And then Kevin Gilbride wasn't really calling plays that helped him out either. And so, I mean, like, I'll just be real. I do think Luis Perez is you know, not forcing it to his receivers, but you know, he's getting them uh, better options and making the best out of it just by being as confident as he is. And so I am looking forward to you know, at least watching this Guardians team a little bit more. I'm not completely sold on the coaching staff, which is mostly why I'm not completely sold on this team. Well, so. I think the thing about the Guardians, like speaking off the coaching staff is, you know, when they win, the energy is good. Yeah. You know, and like th then their defense and their whole team will only play better. But th I feel like they're they're black or they're white. Where you know, if if they're winning, they're gonna be on top. If they're losing, then they're gonna just sink all the way down. Like they're just gonna blow it. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> but like we've seen when they lose, yeah. how how yeah. fiery it gets over on the sideline. I do think though that Luis Perez being there, like Simon said, leadership wise, I think that has changed a little bit. Because he's been, the last two weeks, um, he's been starting. And they have faced some adversity. And I think just having that presence of a quarterback that is a leader has really helped that out. Because, like I said, in the last two weeks, I haven't seen it as much with the Guardians. I mean, they still had the throwing the flag at the ref and stuff like that. But I haven't seen the self-destruction that we saw in the first three weeks when they didn't have a quarterback leading them. Yeah. I agree. Let's we'll see where they go. Yep. We're sorry, go on. Where, where well, I was just saying I agree, and I think a huge part of it is that Prez, while confident, is also calm. Like yeah. He's a nice balance. He's also good. Yeah, that's he's it. Good. <laughs> yeah. But that's all I have to say about that game. All right, so yeah. anything else? Um, where's, uh, what's Luis Perez's chances of making the NFL right now? Because I don't think a team picked him up even after he had a great season in the A. Yeah, I don't think... I don't think a team will pick him up at this point. He's only played two games. Sure. Yeah. Granted, he has played two good games, and they've won both of those games. I think you need to see him at least at least four more weeks to even get a gauge on it. Okay. And, and I think I think if we're going to see guys go from the XFL to the NFL, they have to play lights out, P.J. Walker level. And yeah. Luis is winning games, but he's not 
putting up no. numbers like PJ Walker's. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think he stays in the XFL, at least as far as I've seen. And, you know, it might take like two or three winning seasons in the XFL yeah. at this rate that he's playing. Yeah, but again, that yeah. can change in the next four weeks if he puts up PJ Walker numbers. Okay. Yeah. We'll see. I I mean, I don't think he's going to put up PJ Walker numbers. I don't either. But that's not because of him. I think it's. I mean, I'm gonna throw it back at Kevin Gilbride. I don't. I just don't think he's that great of a coach, and he calls questionable play calling. So he's never gonna have his number as inflated as PJ Walker's. I see. Yeah. So. Could be. Plus, PJ Walker does run a spread. Yeah. So there you go. But we will see. I think. I think he would probably be second tier right now. Like PJ, if you're saying PJ Walker is number one tier, sure. I would say Luis Perez, in terms of going to the NFL next year, would be the next guy there. That's right. As of right now. Yeah. I think even over Jordan Tiamu. Yeah, well, Jordan Tiamu is really uh, rough. We yeah. could uh, yeah, we'll talk about him. Talk in a second. about that. He's coming up next. So. Yeah, let's do it. All right. So the first game on Sunday was the Seattle Battle, or yeah, the Seattle St. Louis. St. Louis. Sorry, St. Louis Battle Hawks at the DC Defenders. It was a pretty boring game. Yeah. We'll go, talk about questionable calls on offense. On both sides. On both sides and. Tyree Jackson took over as the quarterback for DC, and got the win, fifteen to six. Just see how many yeah. passing yards did he have? He had a total, a total of thirty-nine passing yards. Electrifying, ladies and gentlemen. That's XFL football. That's, wow. and and yeah. Cardell Jones did play the first drive, but he had zero passing yards. So team, yeah. the team total had thirty-nine passing yards, and won. He had, so yeah, the team had thirty-nine passing yards, and they won. Yeah, I. Uh, if I'm being honest, like th- this was pretty bad play calling too. You know, I feel like it was no surprise. This was more of a defensive game because the offenses on both sides were very predictable. I mean, on a, obviously we know St. Louis is a running team, so they're gonna pound you, you know, over and over again. And they have uh, this RPO thing going on like probably every ten plays. Other than that. It's screen passes. Same with DC. They rely a lot on screen passes. Honestly, that's easily solved with a cover two zone or even going man and then fighting through. So, I mean, not a lot of creativity. Uh, I know Tyree Jackson's very raw, so we didn't expect him to do much. So I'll give him a pass there. But I really wanted the St. Louis uh, coaching staff to unleash Jordan Tayamu a little bit more. Because I think his his looks were very limited. Like, I don't think he played a terrible game. It's just, like, the play calling. Like, I mean, you can't do much about calling, like, six screens in a row. and then Or, like, five runs in a row and then two screens after that. Or going hitches or, you know, just keeping it short. Like, that's way too predictable. I was hoping for a lot more play action, like, RPO type of stuff. Roll out, looking for medium to deep range uh, passes. And they didn't do that. And I was really disappointed because I thought this game could have been way more entertaining than that. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, Jordan Tamu, while he, he did great kick, uh, controlling the ball, he didn't turn the ball over, he didn't do anything to hurt his team. And I want to say he didn't do anything to help his team, but again, that goes back to your point, Simon. I don't know if the coaching staff gave him the opportunity to help his team. Well, I think yeah. it, I think one play reflects on the, the Battle Hawks' entire game, and that's fourth and one, mm-hmm. where they hand the ball off to Matt Jones. And he gets stuffed and they lose. If you're going to put it, yeah. it, if the game's on the line, fourth and one, you put the ball in the hands of your best player. And your best player isn't Matt Jones, it's Jordan Tayama. Yeah, sure. So you let him make the play to keep your hopes alive. Because with the nine point scoring system, this was only a one score game. Yeah. So on fourth and one, with the, with the game within like five minutes of ending or so, you have to, get, you have to let Jordan Tayama try to make the play. Mm-hmm. And it, I cool. think that one play perfectly summarizes what you guys have been talking about, about the Battle Hawks play calling. Well, that's fair. But also, earlier in that fourth quarter, they did go uh, forward on fourth down in the red zone. And they did give it to Jordan Tayamu. It was just the wrong play because it was a running play. They called quarterback blast, which is basically just, you know, quarterback gets a snap and then runs it down the middle. And it was fourth and one. So I don't know why that was the call because he's in shotgun. So that doesn't make any sense to me. If you're going to run it with the quarterback, then either go power option or a sneak, and it's fourth and one. Mm-hmm. And so they did give it to their best player in that point. 
But I think running it on both occasions was just the wrong thing to do. Well, I was about to say, if you so, yeah. if you let him pass, he still has the option to run. Yeah. But you're you're letting Jordan Tam you're giving Jordan Tamlin the freedom to yeah. be the best player on the field. Yes. No, yes, yeah. So I, I, I agree. You know, um and you know, a, a better opportunity than just here, have the ball and run it, even though you're a quarterback. Like you, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, like, if, if it was, like, an RPO, I think I would have been happier with that. I feel like that's I mean, that's what makes sense on fourth and one, right? Mm -hmm. you got to be unpredictable. Like, they know you're a running team, so how many people do you think they're going to throw in the box? It's probably eight or more, or sorry, six or more or something like that. So, that's, that's on the coaching staff, though. Mm -hmm. They could have won this game, and I think they lost it. I don't think they put, their players lost it. Not either. I mean... Yeah. I will say, well, Damian Washington, their uh, receiver, I mean, he did have 100 receiving yards, so I mean, yeah, they put the numbers out there, they just didn't call the right plays in, cru in uh, sorry, crucial situations. Yeah, and that's a shame, because their defense played well, too. Yes. Kenny Robinson had an interception in a sack. He did? I think he may have even had two interceptions, let me check. No, he just had one. Just one? Yeah, yeah. He did. He had one sack and one interception. Yeah. Well, that's he played really well. So, we talked about what St. Louis did wrong. But I'm going to talk about what DC did right and what we've been talking about for weeks with this DC team is they finally ran the ball. <laughs> they did. Grant said a lot of that was Tyree Jackson just like tucking and running, you know? Sure. But I mean, he only had 32 yards, so. Well, I just mean like it. Oh, they would have yeah. had less rushing attempts yes. if he didn't okay. just make one read and take off. Yeah. But they ran the ball 41 total times. Right. And they ran for good yardage, too, especially their top two backs. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah, Jarrell Presley had 107 rushing yards. Yeah, Presley definitely impressed me. Presley mm -hmm. impressed me <laughs> this week. And, you know, I think moving forward, they need to make it go around him. Plus, this uh, reinforces my theory about DC. They're still undefeated at home. And completely defeated on the road. <laughs> completely defeated on the road. Yeah. So very true. Yeah. Uh, the best part of this game was the snake cup. Oh yeah, the cup snake. The cup snake. Sorry. <laughs> no, yeah. you're good. Go, go ahead and explain something. <laughs> I mean, this is kind of in a uh, DC Defenders tradition. I really wish the Vipers picked this up because that would make way more sense. Because you know, cup snake. But basically, <laughs> uh, you know, just I don't know. I think this happened in the first game. That's what it, where it happened. But a bunch of fans just started stacking their beer cups together. And this time, they were really serious about it. And you could see, like, beer cups getting passed across the stadium to the side uh, where they were stacking it. And it was pretty historic. It got to, okay, approximately, because no one knows for sure, obviously. But it was about 1,300 cups high. So it got really close to the top of the stadium, but it didn't quite get there by the game ended. Yeah. Ironically, um, once the cup snake started getting, you know, bigger, the defenders won, and the tide kind of changed there, which yeah. is an interesting thing. They had two fourth down stops in the fourth quarter, facing the Cubs snake when uh, when that happened. I still think it's funny that luck was a part of it. Yeah. Yeah. The commissioner of the league started. <laughs> yeah, all for luck. <laughs> right, let, me paint, let me paint this picture for our listeners. So me and Simon are sitting here, watching the game right on the TV. Yeah. It's pretty. It's like. It's a pretty boring game. <laughs> and Simon is exhausted. He was exhausted this last weekend. So he's, yeah. I just see him dozing off every once in a while. I look over there and I'm like, oh, Simon's sleeping. The first time they showed the cup snake, he goes, wait, what is that? He sits up and he's like, <laughs> what is this? I'm like, it actually got him excited. <laughs> That's why it was literally the best part of this game. It did, yeah. Simon sat up and was interested in this cup snake. Yeah, it was because the cup snake was less predictable than uh, the coaching staff's play calling. Both of them. So, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, it kind of turned, it kind of turned in. <laughs> here's the last the thing I'm going to say. was the most unpredictable thing. Yeah, here's the last thing I'm going to say about the game, then, then I'm good. No, go if you guys for wanna, it. If you guys want to say add anything else. No, I'm, I think this will be the last statement. So, yes, I mean, it kind of turned into more of, we don't really care about this game anymore. Let's get the cup snake to the top of the stadium. Yes. <laughs> That's what me and Simon were rooting for the whole time in the fourth quarter. Get the cup snake to the top of the stadium. Yes, I'm wondering if they actually can, because it takes a lot of time to, like, you know, bring those beer cups together. Because obviously that section probably put all their cups together, right? And I know, like, the capacity of that field is, like, 12,000. Yeah. 
So, like, if everyone bought a beer, then they probably could. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, some people, you know, maybe they take a little bit longer drinking their beer. Because no one wants to dump their beers out on into the stands. Because then that's just, that's that's a structural problem. From that <laughs> on. But anyways, the Cup Snake is 2-0. and oh. It is 2-0. Oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> Undefeated. Yeah. Never lost. All right. Yeah. We ready to move on to the next game? Yeah, we okay. can't move on. Go so, the last game of the weekend, Sunday night game. Me and Cody said it should be the game of the week, and it was. It delivered. Yes, it was. Yeah. The Tampa Bay Vipers at the LA Wildcats, and LA came back and won 41 to 34. Highest scoring game of the XF in XFL history so far. Combined score. Yeah. And the the final play was in the red zone. Yeah. Like yes, the final meaningful was. play was in the red zone for yep. Tampa Bay. So basically, for the audience, the, let me tell you what happened with the score. Tampa Bay was curb stomping the Wildcats to start the game because yeah. the Wildcats could not stop shooting themselves in the foot. Apparently, both starting centers got injured, yeah. and it led to a lot of really bad snaps. And for the Wildcats, it was more unlucky because Tampa Bay was just landing on the ball. Like, mm-hmm. nothing could go wrong for Tampa Bay in the first half of this game until, like, five minutes left in the second quarter. Yeah, and then uh, Josh Johnson turned it on, and they made the comeback. Yeah, I mean, Tampa was leaving, leading, sorry. Tampa was leading, like, 20-6, to 20-9. I think it was, like, 24-6. Yeah, 24-6. Yeah, at halftime, yeah. Yeah, and uh, they blew it, <laughs> which, I mean, it's not – I wouldn't say it's Tampa's fault necessarily. Like, I guess they had some dry offensive, you know, drives and whatnot. But, I mean, the Wildcats – Definitely, you know, lived up to their potential. I think you and me both agreed that they should have started Martez Carden. We don't know why, but once he started getting more touches, they started like rolling yeah. a little bit. Yeah, more. no, he they put he, he started returning kicks. Yeah, and they had I think was it Elijah Hood or no. Dewan Harris? Dewan Harris was the guy that started, and he made a few a few decent nice runs. Wins. Yeah, he was okay, but it wasn't until the dynamic Martez Carter came in that they actually started to pick up an offensive game. Yeah, and me and Simon were sitting there like. I mean, why is Montez Carter not? Why is he only returning kicks? Why is he not running the ball? And then when he went in there, yeah, started out. And he's he's a great athlete, you know. He's he's way more explosive than Dewan Harris, who isn't a bad back. But Montez Carter is somebody who could definitely break, you know, break off a long a run or catch. Yeah, he you just know? looks he just looks more explosive, like you said. Yeah, and he just more he's a he's a shorter guy too, but he could definitely kind of do it all, mm-hmm. you know. So, but yeah, I think once he got in there, you know, Josh Johnson wasn't like being leaned on as much, and he was able to do a little bit more, yeah. which, uh, you know, resulted in in the offensive explosion for the LA Wildcats. I mean, we saw Josh Johnson just completely open the game up. I mean, yeah. yeah. He has I, a cannon, and he showed it. I do want to make a point here that um, as much as we talk about P.J. Walker putting up ridiculous numbers, I still think LA's passing game is, is deadlier than, than Houston's. Because yep. I feel like Houston has P.J. Walker and Cam Phillips. I think that's it. With maybe now the emergence of, of Holly. Nick Holly. Nick Holly, yeah. yeah. Um, but if you look all around this Wildcats team, even without their leading receiver, Nelson Spruce, yep. they still have dudes all over the field. Dudes the to the field. left. Yeah. I dudes mean, to the right. I just, I just look at 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Josh Johnson completed passes to 12 different receivers in this game. Yeah. That's insane. It's wild. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Cats. They're very deep. And uh, I, I actually like this coaching staff for the Wildcats a lot. I, I think leadership-wise, they're great. Then offensive play – well, I'm okay, offensive play calling-wise, I think their OC is the best in the league. And we talked – or I guess y'all didn't talk about it, but I talked about it before the season started in Norm Chow. He's the same guy who coached up Steve Young. Um Jim McMahon, all these other BYU quarterbacks and whatnot back when they were good back in the day. Oh, Matt Leinert mm-hmm. as well. Uh, yeah. The whole USC dynasty of the early 2000s. So it's not really that surprising that this is probably, you know, the best uh, coaching staff, one of the best in the XFL. Yeah, Norm Chow, he's, he's a good offensive coordinator. There was a little scuffle between him and, and Josh Johnson in the game. Yeah. Josh Johnson, but again, I'll get into it in a second, but jo- I'll just tell you what happened. Josh Johnson got on the phone and said, no, I'm telling you, you need, to, you need to stop complaining. Just calm down and call the plays. And a lot of people would take it take it wrong. But Josh Johnson, we got to remember, is probably the most 
seasoned veteran in the NFL in this XFL right. league. Yeah. So if anyone can do that, it's him. It's yeah. Josh Johnson. And, and, it, and it wasn't aggressive. I mean, it wasn't like, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, I wasn't saying you're a bad offensive coordinator. Yeah. So like it, it wasn't m- Matt McGloin on yeah. the sideline. Yeah, it was more It was, I got this. Yeah, it was more of, um, and that's a thing that can happen. It was more of just two, two very good at their job as Josh Johnson quarterback, Norm Chow is offensive coordinator, mutual respect, like, hey, just do your job and we'll get this done. Yeah, I agree. I don't think he meant anything personal about no, it. No, not it's, at all. That's just sports. Yeah. You know, and, you know, I it, I would be curious to see how Jim Zorn or Kevin uh, Gilbride would handle some, their quarterback saying that to them, or Josh Johnson even saying that to them, because mm-hmm. I think they might have a meltdown, to be honest. Yeah. But anyways... Uh, it was a very well coached game it for was. the Wildcats. I mean, do you want to get into the specifics? Um, yeah, so I mean, Josh Johnson, like you said, turned it on in the second half, um, led his team to what? Uh, 18, 18 point comeback? Yep. yep. Um, he, he threw for 288 yards and four touchdowns and one interception. So that's, again, on PJ Walker's level for this, this one week, I would say. Yeah. Um, they had, they had a decent running game. But yeah, like I said, 12 different receivers. And three of them had over 50 receiving yards. So, I mean, he definitely distributed the ball. And they, like we said in the other game, they were unpredictable, D.C. and St. Louis. Or, yeah, St. Louis. This they game were. was unpredictable. Yeah, this like, game. They didn't know. But the other teams were predictable. Yeah, they were predictable. Yeah, okay. LA, LA's offense was unpredictable in the second half. Yeah. And I mean... We'll get into a second when we move to Tampa Bay, but Tampa Bay didn't play bad. No. They played really good. I think Tampa Bay is an up-and-coming team. I think they're going to make a push in the East. Yeah, the record doesn't reflect where they are right yeah. now. Yeah, where they are right now. Yeah. At the beginning of the season, they were definitely terrible. Yeah. But they're, yeah. they're an up-and-coming team, and I mean, it came down to the last play, and it honestly looked like a miscommunication. It was, the, 100%. Because the, the receiver, it looked like Cornelius threw it, expecting the receiver to turn around. And the receiver kept drifting mm-hmm. outside, and it was an interception. On the last just, play? Yeah, on the last play when it got picked. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, I think if they... I'm, I'm be ser- like honest with you, too. I think if the communication is right between those two, I think they score a touchdown right there. And they probably win the game because they probably... Maybe they go for two mm-hmm. instead of one Yeah, with the scoring system. So. Sure. Yeah. I think... Yeah, I agree. The Vipers are on the rise. They played as good a game as you could probably hope for. I mean, there's not much you could do against, you know, seasoned vets like Josh Johnson, Norm Chow. Now that's tough. But I'm, I'm going to give some credit to Mark Trustman. I know he gets a lot of hate, you know, but let's, let's you know, reel it back a little bit. He's still a good coach. Let's not get it twisted. In the Canadian Football League, he did win two or three Grey Cups. Um, and in case y'all don't know, that's the equivalent of a Super Bowl. The Canadian Football League, up until, I mean, I actually, I'd still probably say right now, is probably the second best professional football league in the world, next to the NFL. And, you know, that's pretty hard to do. You know, play calling wise, you know, he called a pretty solid game, I'd say. Yeah. You know, and, you know, it, it comes down to players because coaches can't win games. Well, you know, that's just how that works. I'd say the only thing that Mark Trussman did wrong. As he definitely started to take his foot off the gas. Yeah. When, when they built up that huge lead, I think they should have just kept staying aggressive, mm-hmm. honestly. I think it was too early. You know, he didn't, like, he didn't slam on the brakes, but that's kind of what ended up happening when he took his foot off the gas. No, I it's agree. Like, instead of coasting, you know, that like, they slowed down, and L.A. Turned it up. Put the pedal to the metal. Yeah. And by the time that, you know, the Vipers were rallying back, which they pulled it back to within a score. They were down 27-41 at one point. Right. And they scored a touchdown, and were within one score. So, you know, I, I think that this is a lesson that they'll learn for the future. I guess they probably just didn't expect that kind of comeback potential from an XFL team. Sure. But now they know. Yeah, I think the Vipers' biggest enemy right now is probably indecision. Because... If they committed to Daniel Cornelius or Quinton Flowers or whoever earlier than Aaron Murray, um, then they probably have a couple, maybe not a couple, at least one more win by now. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like you were saying, they took their uh, pedal off the gas. I think that was indecision too. Mm-hmm. I think Mark Tressman didn't really want to test <laughs> how good uh, Daniel Cor- 
Is it Daniel? It's Taylor Cornelius. Sorry, Taylor Con- Cornelius. He looks like a Dan. It's okay. Yeah, but anyways, well, he's how his Dan Williams. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyways, like how he didn't want to test, you know, how good his stats would look like if he threw it, you know, over thirty times a game, you know, at least this game. He did thir- thirty-four passes. Yeah. Well, you know, because significantly to, yeah. more for three hundred yards, though. Yeah, yeah. So, but you know, I think there's there's still a little bit of a la- of a lack of trust. Now with Norm Chow and Josh Johnson, like Norm Chow knows Josh Johnson is a is a seasoned vet, has a number of games under his belt, right? And then I'm pretty sure Josh Johnson respects uh, you know Norm Chow that way because you know he is an older guy. He's been around since like the 70s, 60s, coaching wise. Uh, Mark Trustman's still a relatively young guy, so maybe that respect isn't there for him uh, that Cornelius might have for him. And then you know. Taylor Cornelius is a virtual nobody before making it to the XFL, you know. So I think that trust isn't quite there yet, but over the season it will build. Mm -hmm. Because if he trusts his quarterback, then he's going to lean on him to make more plays, and he probably wouldn't have, you know, took his uh, foot off the gas pedal. I guess you could say Mark Trestman needs to trust his man to make the plays at the end of the game. So Cody is very punny this, this night. Sure. On our uh, podcast, but yeah, that Wildcats one went under the under the radar, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but I will say, last thing I have for Tampa Bay, they have two really good running backs that they need to lean on yep. and to take the pressure off Taylor Cornelius and Debian Smith and Jaquise Patrick. Both of them are really, really good, yeah. and they can catch too. Yes. yes. So I think they should lean on them moving forward, and yeah, like Simon said, build that trust between Taylor Cornelius and the offense and, def- and team, really. Yep. And it takes time, you know, this isn't something you know, that just clicks out of nowhere, you know. It's very rare and lucky for any football team to do that under a new quarterback. Mm-hmm. Under a third string quarterback, that is. Yeah. So, you know, we'll, we'll see. But I think the Vipers could potentially steal a playoff spot if the defenders aren't careful. I'm, I'm way more confident about the Vipers than the defenders, if I'm being yes, honest. Yes, me too. Okay. Me too. Do you? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Actually, that, that's it. I think games. that does it for the recap. Yeah. Should we yep. move into our uh, offensive defensive players of the week? Yep. yep. Let's do it. Okay. Just so you can go ahead and start us off. So, yeah, it's a perfect segue because my offensive player of the week comes from the LA Wildcats that we were just talking about. And it is quarterback Josh Johnson. Um, he threw for four touchdowns, and he led his team to a monster comeback. I mean, it might have been one of the bigger comebacks we've seen so far in the XFL. Yeah, I agree. Uh, he's my offensive player of the week, too. I think it's hard to deny him that. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he just had a really good game. Here's the reason why they came back. Uh, what else could you hope for, you know? Cody? Josh Johnson <laughs> is nice. my offensive player of the week. I feel I, – I was even talking about this just, like, watching through the games is that I feel like we're not going to have any disagreement. I will say that my honorable mention – is Cam Phillips? Sure. Yeah. For and for the uh, Roughnecks yeah. with that ten catch, one hundred twenty-two yard, two touchdown performance. Yeah. But still, Josh Johnson, far and away. Yeah. Um, do you have any honorable mentions? Not really. I think I think it was pretty obvious for me that it was Josh Johnson. Like I'm sure there are other players who played well. I mean, Luis Perez or Mikael McKay might be up there, I guess. Mm-hmm. But they're definitely worth mentioning. Yeah. They played great. I yeah. mean, they're a part of that win, but also it was a Dallas team that wasn't really, mm-hmm. you know, favored to win this game, in my opinion. So, um, for my two, Simon didn't have a, a clear and definite honorable mention. I'll say two. Okay. Um, I think Presley, Jewel Presley, That's running back one. from DC, had 107 rushing yards. Should be an honorable mention. He should be mentioned at least. He. Carried that team to a win. Really, he really did. He really did. <laughs> um, so I'm not, without him, they don't win. He had a good burst. Yeah, I'm excited and, to see him going forward. Yeah, it'll be good moving forward next next week. And then I'm also going to say Damian Washington, the receiver from St. The Louis. Hawks. Yep. yep. He had 114 receiving yards on five catches. So he was averaging 22, 22 yards a catch. It's just a shame that neither of those teams found the end zone, really. I know. There was one touchdown in the whole game. Boring. But, yeah. Anyways. Yeah, go ahead. Cody, you want to start with the Defensive Player of the Week? Yeah, sure. So my Defensive Player of the Week is going to be Kayvon Walker for the New York Guardians. Ooh. Defensive tackle. He had five combined tackles, two sacks, four quarterback hits, and two tackles for loss. He's just an absolute game wrecker. Yeah. And, you know, I feel like with this Guardians team, it specifically starts at the defensive line. 
and the other guys don't make the plays that they need to make if Kayvon Walker isn't just pushing the center and guard into the quarterback's lap every play. Yep. So, I do want to say one thing about him. I had I had him on my list as well too. But I think didn't we also mention him last week? I think this is a reoccurring thing. I think yeah, he no. he's That's another he's one of the NFL defensive players that we can see moving forward. I think he's a guy that should get a shot in the NFL next year. I think he's been yeah balling out really. Yeah, he's <laughs> consistent. And, you know, like. He's kind of having his way with these XFL linemen, and that's a very good point, Jesse, is, you know, he might get the chance to play up in the NFL, especially at a position like defensive tackle where we're seeing less and less, like, super-duper dominant defensive tackles, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the opportunity definitely exists. Yeah. I mean, the position's open on the Broncos, so. You're right. Sure. I, yeah. I like to see him in Denver. Sure. I'll yeah. take Avon Walker. So, yeah, he, he's... He's great. He's also good on special teams, too. So Yeah, hey, I agree. He was actually somebody I was considering for, too, because he does lead the XFL in sacks. Yeah. And that, and I mean, that's because he got two this game, so mm-hmm. that definitely helped him out. But I'll actually give it to his teammate, um, Ryan Mueller. I, yeah, Ryan Mueller. Yeah. I want to say he's a linebacker. He might be a defensive no, end, though. I think he's a defensive end. He's probably. I think he's one of those linebacker hybrid, hybrid yeah. yeah line ends. He was coming off the edge, which was a yeah. little confusing. But well, anyways, he. Uh, I mean, I think he didn't, you know, stuff the stat sheet, but he had a really big play. He came off the edge, and Philip Nelson was about to throw the ball, and so it, it looked really smooth. To be honest, it was very athletic. He and it wasn't a terrible throw either. But he jumped up there. He tipped the ball to himself, and then he outran Philip Nelson and the. Uh, and the running back, I don't know which one, but he outran them like 30, 40 yards for a touchdown. And that, I think that was a game changing play. So I, I'll have to give it to him because that really changed the tide. And, you know, uh, you got to you gotta take the fans out of the experience if you want to win away. So he, um, he was one of my honorable mentions because that was the nail in the coffin for the Renegades, yeah. honestly. Yeah. Was just, I mean, the Renegades still had a chance. And then that game, that play put it out of reach. And, Man, it was a great play, honestly. Yeah. The, maybe the play of the week, honestly. Yeah. So, yeah. Other, other than maybe a play from the Dragons game. But. Yeah. So my... I'm going to give my defense player of the week we, to a guy we've talked about before, Kenny Robinson. Mm-hmm. The um, safety cornerback hybrid person from uh, St. Louis, the Battle Hawks. He had... Um, he only had five tackles, but he had one sack and one interception and I just think if you get a sack and an interception in the same game you got to be mentioned because that that means you're all over the field if you're intercepting passes as a safety and getting sacks that means you're all over the field so I'm going to give him my defense player of the week yeah. Yeah. Um, I do have one honorable mention he uh, comes from Seattle talking about that play that might be the play of the week um, linebacker Jordan Martin no, that's he, a good one. Uh, yeah, he's my honorable mention. He uh, had a pick six, and it was another one of those batted balls. He batted it, caught it, took it to the end zone. So I'm going to give him his honorable mention. So I think he should be mentioned as well. All right. Good. Does, is that it for uh, That is the it second... for, for week five of the XFL. When, when we, we come back, we will preview week six. All right. Coming up next. Welcome back to the Cycle 365. This is episode 24 in honor of Kobe Bryant. Loki. And, oh, I gotta give our uh, intramural team a shout out. Yes. The Lakers <laughs> got our first intramural regular season game win last night. And for Cody, Jesse, and I, this is gonna sound really sad, but we also got our first intramural regular season win in three, four years well, for you, Jesse. Three I played three. Years? I only played three. Oh, oh, okay. So yeah, three years for all of us. So that means we're on like a fourteen game losing streak, <laughs> leading up to leading up to last night. So there we go. I I had the honor of wearing Kobe's number twenty four for the game, and it was great. Anyways, we're here to talk about week six, right, of yes. the XFL. We're gonna preview it. Real quickly. Yep. Take it away, Jesse. So, um, moving forward, I think this first game of the week is going to, or this first game, yeah, first game of the week is the game of the week. 
Oh. Um, it is, again, 2 p.m. Eastern time if you're on the West, East Coast listening to us. Um, and 12 o'clock Mountain Time if you're here with us. On ABC, it is the Houston Roughnecks at the New York Guardians. Ooh. Game of the week. <laughs> Wait, at the New York Guardians? Yes. Oh, okay. It's going to be a good one. So, I think key matchups to look for in this game. Obviously, P.J. Walker versus Luis Perez. Yes. Again, talking about two of the, maybe besides Josh Johnson, two of the best quarterbacks in the XFL right now. Yeah. So, yeah. What else you guys got? I mean, P.J. PJ Walker is going to face another tough defense this mm-hmm. week. Yeah. Who is probably better than the Dragons, honestly, in the secondary. Yeah. And their front four, I mean, the Guardians don't have to blitz to create pressure. Uh, like we just talked about with Kayvon Walker tearing it up from the inside. So we'll see what happens to this Roughnecks offense against this Guardians defense. But I'm definitely excited because the Guardians have been trending up. And I think this game proves if they're legit for a championship mm-hmm. contention or not. Yep. This could, I'm going to be honest, this could be the preview of the championship. Like could these be. two teams could be in the championship moving forward. Potentially with the three-way tie in the East right now. Yep. Yes. Yeah, I think it'll be interesting. Um, I mean, I'll be real. I think it's important for the Guardians to come out and at the very least compete, you know, in this game. And I know that's really not asking for a lot, but for the New York Guardians, that can be a lot. Because I could see them having maybe two or three not as great drives as they hoped for and then falling apart completely. And, and then this isn't as close as we all think it is. But on the bright side, I do think that Luis Perez will keep them in it for as long as he can. Uh, I'm Like I said, I'm just always going to be very skeptical of this New York coaching staff and, and their ability of calling the right game. So yeah, I'm going to agree with that. I think I'm not going to say this is a high-scoring game. I don't think it will be because I think where the high-scoring comes from is when P.J. Walker plays a bad defense and just goes off. Yeah. But this is not a bad defense in New York. I think I think it's gonna be a lower scoring game. I'm gonna guess I'm gonna guess Houston scores twenty points and, and wins it. But but it's gonna be close, like twenty four to eighteen. I mean it's definitely strength on strength though. Yeah. And weakness sure. versus weakness because I mean the Roughnecks defense has been clutch at the end of games. You know, so that they have that going for them, but over the course of a whole game, they usually start off pretty slow. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly what the Guardians are gonna need. They're if the Guardians can get up by two scores, like two solid scores, not like six and six, but like eight and eight, like so 16-0, they have a very good chance of winning this game. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Should we make our picks? Yeah, go for it. Um, as much as this could be a trap game for Houston, I'm still going to pick Houston to win. I think Houston will make more plays in the end that they need to make, and I do think I'm with Simon, and I'm skeptical about this Guardians coaching staff and team, is if they can continue to play under the pressure or will it, I think they'll buckle. Yep. No, I agree. Uh, I'm going to pick the Roughnecks as well. Uh, I'll just be real. I think even if this coaching staff is calling a pretty okay game and whatnot, I don't think it will be enough to edge out the, the Roughnecks. Because if I'm being real, you know, I don't – the New York fan base isn't really that strong. And that's that's something we could talk about later. I'm, I'm kind of not really liking XFL teams being in major ci- or uh, major cities that have, like, pretty established, you know, fan bases for NFL teams like Dallas, L.A. Um, I mean, that's just what New comes York. to mind first. New York. Yeah. So I, I don't think the fan base is going to help them out at all. Mm. Can I add on to that real fast before sure. you go, Cody? I think that's a great a – great a point you make, Simon. Like, even though Houston is really good, they still don't have the the fan base that St. Louis has. Yeah. Because there's no established NFL team in St. Louis right now, and so that that means all the football fans have this XFL team to rally around. Um, so I think that that could definitely be something moving forward that that the XFL should look at is to moving teams, moving teams to places that don't have cities that don't have. Um, solidified NFL team. Yes, I agree. I think it'd be cool to see the Wildcats move to San Diego. But anyways, uh, Cody, what's your prediction? Even though I talk the Guardians up, I'm going to keep up the pattern of choosing against them because it's been working out for them. Okay. For you or for them? For them. Okay. So Not for me. So no, no, no. I've been wrong. 
but I'm picking Houston. Okay. But in hopes of New York winning. Okay. All right. All right. Fair enough. Next Second game. game of the weekend on Saturday, 5 p.m. Eastern time, 3 p.m. Mountain time on FS2. The St. Louis Battlehawks at the Tampa Bay Vipers. Oh Could be another very good game. My God. I kind of like that game a little bit better than Roughnecks versus Guardians. Yeah. To be honest. Yeah. I mean, I think. This is such a big game. Yes. It is. For both it is. Teams. Yeah, yes. and it really is. I think, because, like, yeah, St. Louis with a win will take control of the East. And Tampa Bay needs to win to keep in contention. Well, I was yes. going to say, Tampa Bay right now is. One and four. One and four. Mm-hmm. One more loss would probably eliminate them, honestly. Yes. At one and five, yeah, probably. Yeah, because then they can only get, well, 500 is their cap. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, it's do or die for Tampa Bay, but also, if St. Louis loses this second game in a row, they're not really in control of their own destiny anymore. Nope. No, they're free falling. Especially if the Guardians beat Houston. Yeah. A lot can happen yeah. this week. There's, there's a lot going on that could uh, affect the standings in the East. And, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think this is going to be a really good game. I I really want to say that the Battlehawks win this game, but their, their play calling, or at least I would say the lack of the diversity in their play calling, definitely uh, gives me some doubts. Yeah, they did not score a touchdown last week. No, they, they should have. They did not score a touchdown. They should have. And it, part of it makes me wonder if the Battlehawks are just another one of those teams where when they go on the road, they're not the same as when they play at home. Yeah. Which like would be explainable with their crowd presence. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. With like the, the more seating that they have. But you know, and I, I feel like this Tampa Bay team, they're they're feisty, you know, and like I, I feel like they're really scrappy and you know, they showed that against the Wildcats by not just laying down when they lost the lead. Mm-hmm. You know. They they fought back and they, they made the Wildcats play the whole game. Yes. So I think what I'm looking forward to in this game is I haven't seen St. Louis's defense, like, like the, I don't think they're very good run-stopping defense, and I do think that Tampa Bay has the two best running backs, maybe besides Cameron Payne and Lance Dunbar. Sure. But in Jaquiz Patrick and Devion Smith, I think they're going to have big days, and I think they're going to run all over St. Louis. I agree. I'm, I'm looking forward to Cornelius versus Te'amu, and... Uh, this is a matter of, I feel like this game is going to come down to which coach trusts their quarterback with the game on the line. Yes, yep. I agree. And based off of that, if you guys don't mind, my prediction. Yeah, go ahead first. I think Tampa Bay is going to win this game because I feel like Trestman, you know, he, he put the ball in Cornelius' hands with the game on the line mm-hmm. last week. It didn't pan out for him, but I don't think that's going to stop Trestman from doing it again. I think... I think Cornelius and Tressman and the Vipers pull out the win against the Bat Hawks, probably at the end of the game. Ooh. Simon? Is, uh, sorry, I don't know if you mentioned this yet, or maybe I just wasn't paying attention. Is this game in St. Louis or Tampa Bay? It's in Tampa Bay. Oh, okay, well, yeah, that's different. I'm going to pick the Vipers. I mean, if this was in St. Louis, I would have given them the edge, but I think, I mean, it, it sucks because I know Daniel Cor- Sorry, Taylor Cornelius has thrown like two game ending interceptions already in two games so far this season. Which, you know, it, it's something to keep in mind, you know, keep keep an eye on, I'd say. Because he is a young quarterback, you know. Uh, let's let's be real, those those interceptions are still in his head, it's still fresh, you know, because they were the last two games he played and the ending of those last two games. So that's something for sure to keep in mind, but I kind of believe in Mark Trustman a little bit more than the St. Louis Battlehawks uh, coaching staff. So I'm going to give the Vipers. I think it's going to be a... I want to say it's the score is going to look... It's not going to reflect how close this game will actually be. Mm-hmm. I'll say that. Uh, I think this is a game that will be close for a little bit. But I, ought to, I could see the Vipers potentially blowing out the Battlehawks if they're not careful. Okay. So... I am going to agree, agree with both of you. I'm going to pick Tampa Bay to win this game. Dang um, it, I thought I had the hot take. Nah, I think it's... Uh, <laughs> I think it's, like you said, it's do or die for them. And I think they'll get it done. Again, but it is different if if it's in St. Louis. Yes. I'd give it more of Battle Hawks a shot. But it's in Tampa Bay, which could not be better for Tampa Bay. I think they need to be there. 
to uh, do it, and I think I think the running game is going to prevail. Yep. They're building up a, a fan base, slowly but surely. More fans are coming to the games, even though they've lost every game they've been to. So we'll, we'll see. You know, you never know. But I think this is going to be a really good game. There's uh, playoff implications. Yes, I do think it comes down to the very, very end, the wire. I think that comeback period that we come to come to know in the XFL is definitely going to be used in this game. Yes, yes. All right. All right. Moving on to the Sunday games. The uh, first game on Sunday doesn't start till two o'clock Mountain Time, four o'clock Eastern Time on Dang. FS1. Yeah, they're getting later and later. They want that nightcap game. Yeah, they're getting there. Yeah. All right. Um, the, so this game is the Dallas Renegades at the DC Defenders. Oh. Wow, what a mess. <laughs> yeah. That might be the game of the week just because it'll be competitive, but it will probably be boring. Dude, I'm, all the games will be competitive. You know what I'm looking forward to in this game? <coughs> what? The Cup Snake making it to the top of the stadium. <laughs> oh, it's this is in DC? in DC. Well, that answers my question. Yeah. Honestly, I, mean, I think I think what we got to look for going into this game is is Cardell Jones going to start for DC or is Tyree Jackson going to start for DC? Who do you think should start? Is there not? I thought there would have been a report out by now saying that. I don't know if there is or not yet. Okay. If I'm Pep Hamilton, I have to play the, the quarterback that just won me the game. I mean, Tyree Jackson didn't do anything special. Yeah. But Cardell Jones has to figure out something mentally. Yeah. Because yeah. and if you put him on the field. You're giving the other team a chance to win the game, honestly. Because he's not doing what you ask. And even though Tyree Jackson is raw, Pep Hamilton understands that. And it was reflected in the play column. And it was, you can see, Pep Hamilton isn't going to ask Tyree Jackson to do things that he would ask Cardell Jones to do. Right? He's not going to ask him to stretch the field. You know, Pep Hamilton is going to adjust the offense to Tyree Jackson. And we saw that last week. And we saw it work. Because there were a lot more RPOs. With Tyree Jackson, there was a lot more quarterback options, powers, all kinds of stuff like that. And I think that Tyree Jackson is the obvious play here, honestly. Because I, I just don't, I can't trust Cardell Jones after what I've seen these past few weeks. Uh, agreed. I Well, actually, I'll, I'll say this. I think they will start off with Tyree Jackson. But if things start not going their way, I think this would be a good game to, you know, try to get Cardell Jones' confidence back. Because I think all of us agree that it's it's in his head. Like, Cardo Jones isn't a terrible quarterback. We know what he's capable of. This dude won a national championship. Mm -hmm. Obviously, he had a lot of help. But he still won a national championship. He's, he looked good, too. Like, it wasn't like he's been trashed this whole season. You know, so it's all about getting out of his own head. You know, but I think to start off, let's work in Tyree Jackson. If he doesn't work out, then you could still throw in Cardo Jones and probably still win the game, to be honest. Um, this is a Dallas team, in my opinion, that is reeling, and everyone in the XFL kind of knows it. You know, they do have uh, an experienced staff too, so I mean, you know, you never know. They could maybe pull off the upset, but this is a game that DC should win at home. What's the especially. spread, Jesse? Um, I'd have to go to a different. Oh, are you not on ESPN? I'm not on ESPN. Okay, well, we could keep. Cody, you find the spread while I talk about it. Go okay. for it. Um, I was going to say, along the lines of what Simon said, I think this game could not have come at a better time for both teams. Because both teams are trying to work through a quarterback situation. Yes. And both teams are slumping right now. Yeah. I would say. But I think it's going to work out for both these teams. I think both of them, I think both of them will get some work for their quarterbacks and kind of, I would say, figure out what they're going to do for the second half of the season at quarterback. For both Dallas and DC. Yeah, agreed. So what's okay, the spread? Great. What is the spread? The spread is four and a half points for DC. It's the second biggest spread of the weekend. Wow. Oh. I mean, DC is at home, so. I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, I feel like, to talk about the Renegades a little bit, this, and Simon talked about it in the last segment, this is a really complete roster, especially on the defensive side of the ball. It's not going to be easy for the defenders to, you know, win this game. Yeah. But I just the def the defenders defense also stepped up last week when mm -hmm. they needed to. Yeah. Against an offense that regardless of like the play calling for St. Louis is better than Dallas. the Renegades offense. Right now, yes. Sure. Right now. So if do you guys have anything else to say or I mean I 
I think we all agree that DC is proud to go in this game. Yeah, right? I'm, I'm picking DC. Yeah, I'm taking DC. Yeah. Um, I'd say the biggest factor for me though is that they're they're the home team. And yes. I feel like you know their record shows that they play well at home. Yeah. This is definitely a side note, but uh, this I mean this is my opinion. But DC Stadium is like the perfect XFL stadium, you know, because it's really not that big. Like the capacity is like. I mean, I don't know, it's like fifteen to 20,000, but it looks way bigger than that. So it gives you the feel that there's more people there, which uh, adds to the fan experience and also the game experience because, you know, players, it, it could kind of psych them out. They just have very, like, steep, uh, what is it, seating. So it looks like there's way more people packing the stadium than there really is. It's kind of built like a hockey arena at that it point. It is. Well, it is a soccer stadium. So. Yeah. Okay. But it's, I mean, still, the structure itself is really good. Like, I think a lot of teams, if they were to find a structure like that, that would probably be the model, you know? Because it's, it's perfect. It's not too big, so it doesn't feel empty. Like, MetLife is way too big for the Guardians. Yeah. 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 Um, the Seattle Stadium, CenturyLink, is way too big. The LA Stadium is too big, too. It's, yeah, which is ironic. Or I, just empty. It's, I think it's more empty because it's the same size as DC Stadium. Which is uh, Oof. saying I mean, a lot. That just goes back to what we talked about earlier. LA, LA's market is just saturated. Yeah. They have way too much money. They have two NFL teams, an XFL team, two baseball teams, two basketball. Two basketball. Teams. Like yeah, it's just you need to move. You need to move the Wildcats somewhere else if you want it to be good. <laughs> but anyways, yeah. Jesse, are you taking? You said you already said you're taking DC. Right? I am taking DC. Yeah, okay. So um, we all I'm got DC. DC. Yeah. So we get to talk about the Wildcats game then. Um, just saying. I just said last note for um. The DC Dallas game, look for the Cup Snake to reach the top of the stadium. I'm hoping it does. Team Cup Snake. <laughs> yes. Okay, so that brings us to the last game of the week. Um, it is the Sunday night game, uh, seven o'clock Eastern Time, five o'clock Mountain Time on ESPN Two. Oh. It is the LA Wildcats at the Seattle Dragons. In an interesting, a very interesting development in this game. We will talk about it later, but due to coronavirus, there will be no fans of this game. They're just gonna play football in an empty stadium. Okay. But we'll talk it'll about still be broadcast. It. It'll also be broadcast. Yes. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you so can we'll still, be able to watch. Everyone it. can still watch it. But um, again, like I said, we'll talk about it later in the show when we talk about the effect of coronavirus on sports, the whole sports industry right now. Yes. Um, but all that being said, let's dive into the teams. Yeah. Uh, if I'm being honest. Like, I mean, we'll talk about it more later. I think this game would be closer if there are fans there. Because Seattle is still a good, like, city to have, you know, uh, sports teams at, you know. Because all their fans are extremely loyal. You know, they'll pack the stadium whether y'all are losing or not. And that's been the same for the Dragons this whole season. Like, the fan experience has been great. You know, obviously it seems empty at times. But that's just because half the stadium is closed. So that's that. But I would say this would be a closer game. But... Like I said, we'll talk about it later. At this point, it's just which team is better. You know, Raw, who's better? Like, it's me against you. There's really no outside effects. And I think it's easily the Wildcats. I'd agree. I think the Wildcats, especially Josh Johnson coming off, of the, game, off the game he just had, bringing them back against Tampa Bay, I think, I think he's rolling. And I think, I don't know when Nelson Spruce is going to come back, but when he does, they will have the best receiving core in the XFL. And Agreed. Yeah, I think they're just a better team. I mean, as if they don't already. I mean, even their third string receivers or their tight ends are mossing people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, and yeah. every receiver is capable, and so are their running backs. Yeah. And For sure. something that I thought was insane looking at this is LA is only favored by three. Okay. I think well, that maybe might, that might be a little old, too. Yeah, that might change the fact that this, the fans won't be there now. Yeah. But. Because it just came out today, right? Yes, yeah, it came out today. So. But, um, yeah, I think just like Simon said, if you put team versus team, L.A. is better. Yeah. And I think that's what it will come down to. Because yeah. if you have fans there, then, you know, it, the, the the moods of the game will definitely swing and be amplified. You know, but if it's just team versus team, then, like, there's no, like, crowd to... I mean, this there's is no energy to feed weird. off of. Yeah, there's no, there's really no energy to feed off of except for the energy that the coaching staff and the team is putting out, and that's a really big deal in 
in all sports, but in football especially, because it's a game full of mood swings, if we're being honest. You know, like, it, there, there aren't as many opportunities to change a game, I would say, as, like, maybe a basketball or hockey, to be honest. So, I do think that the Wildcats will win easily. Josh Johnson is on a hot streak right now. I hope they start Martez Carter and do the right thing, you know, do him right, give him more touches. And, you know, I know this is a tough Seattle defense, you know, they have a lot of talented players, but I'm looking for Josh Johnson and Norm Chow to dial it up again, so. I think I think the Wildcats are gonna put it to the Dragons yeah. hard on Sunday night. Sure. Because yeah. I just, <laughs> the Seattle defense is gonna be good, but I feel like once, if. Okay, we've seen it all season with Seattle. They play, their defense plays good for two quarters, three quarters, but their offense just doesn't accomplish anything. And then in the fourth quarter, the other team just runs away with it. And I feel like I honestly wouldn't be surprised if the Wildcats won by over 20 points. I feel like Seattle's not going to be able to compete, and at that point they're going to be 1-5 and looking at not making the playoffs. Yeah, I agree. This could be the game that knocks Seattle out. And that's that sucks. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, their fan base, I mean, you know, if they were to make the playoffs, their fan base would be going wild during a playoff game. Mm-hmm. If I, I, mean, I don't know why they would play it in Seattle, though. But anyways, and plus, you know, coronavirus. So I guess no one would be there. And theoretically, we'll it would have been weeks, a cool weeks, thing. That's the week's yeah. advance. Yeah. Yeah. But theoretically, it would have been cool. Yes. I'm going to say, I'm going to say, I'm going to agree with you guys, L.A., just destroys Seattle. I think this could be a game. I mean, sure, granted, Tampa Bay's defense isn't Seattle's defense, mm. but let's think about it. Josh Johnson and LA's offense put up 38 or 34, 34 points in two quarters of football. Yeah. If they come out and play well and not having a, a crowd there to like hinder them, they probably put up 50 in this game. We might see our first 50 spot. Yep. And, I mean, I think even if they do start slow, it's easier to get out of your head if there's nobody there but you and your mm-hmm. teammates. Because yeah. it kind of gives off a more of a scrimmage or practice type of vibe. And I think that's way less pressure for a lot of these younger players. And even if there was pressure, like, th- I think this Wildcats coaching staff is just, is just way more, uh, you know, older and wiser. And they're veteran coaches, you know. Yeah. And nothing against Jim Zorn, really. Like, he's done some good things with... Uh, Seattle, but I think his coaching staff is way younger than the Wildcats yeah, coaching He's staff. done the best with what he's been given because he ain't been given a lot. Yeah, yeah. and I mean, that's kind of his own fault because he's his own GM too. True. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. so that's that. To wrap it up, I'm going to say yes, LA wins this game, and I'm going to say it due to the fact that they will score way more points than Seattle can keep up with. Yeah. Is there, are we... So what are we expecting out of Seattle, though? Will they put up a fight? I mean, they might they might fight for the first half, but then the I'm gonna half. Be, I'm going to be honest. I feel like the scrimmage feel might play better to the Seattle's coaching strengths, coaching okay. staff strengths, just because they're not very high energy, honestly. Like, you know, Seattle's just kind of like a, a do-your-job do kind of culture. So I feel like, you know, while they would feed off of the fans being there, I feel like the scrimmage might play to their benefits more than LA but sure. I don't I still don't see them competing in this game they're going to get snacks <laughs> I know that's I, fair I think they'll compete for the first two quarters for the first half I think they'll be yeah. a competitive game I don't think we're going to see a blowout in at halftime but I think as the game gets on a little bit more into the early fourth quarter stage I think Josh Johnson will take over I think the Wildcats throw a 40 plus yard pass yeah. to end the second half or the or to start the third quarter, and they just never look back from there. Yeah, low-key, this might be a game where you might see a flea flicker or some crazy, you know, trick play go for a touchdown, and then that'll be the Double reverse game. pass touchdown to Josh Johnson. There you go. It could happen. Maybe. If I'm being honest. But anyways, right. that is it for week six of the XFL. Bang. Coming up next, NBA. Yep. A lot of NBA news. Welcome to the third segment.
of episode 24 of The Cycle. I'm Cody Stoffer, and we're going to be talking some NBA recap. Starting off with probably the biggest news and the biggest headline grabber of the past weekend, L.A. Braun taking over and asserting himself as the best player on, on the planet. Yeah. So it all start it all started on Friday against Giannis and the Bucks. And LeBron not only performed well on the offensive side of the ball, but he gave Giannis some troubles near the end of the game and definitely was a part of their clutch win. Simon, I don't know how much of the game that you watched, but what were your takeaways from Giannis versus LeBron part whatever it is? Because it's basically like the fu- future of the NBA, right, as, as, with Giannis having won MVP versus True. LeBron. Yeah, uh, I mean, there's definitely arguments that could be made that LeBron deserves MVP, you know, after this game. And he he stepped up, you know, and I think everyone knows this by now, but LeBron definitely takes a back seat, as I think he should, to Anthony Davis. And, you know, let's, let's him, you know, be more ball dominant than him at times. You know, and it happens, you know. But then there are also games, specifically games against guys like, you know, Zion, Luka, younger players. And then, you know, Giannis, as we've seen, where he just, he dominates and he, like, goes all out to prove a point, you know, because he knows people are, are watching. And, you know, this is kind of how he is. Like, I think, I mean, I've, I've seen this said before, you know, on ESPN and whatnot, but... I think he definitely values like challenging the next generation of NBA basketball players and you know really put, give, giving them a test. You know Kobe did it, Michael Jordan did it, and now and now it's his time to do it cuz you know um, he's he's kind of the definition or the face of a generation of basketball, you know, of NBA basketball. And so you know he he really showed off and it's because he has been resting. I'll I'll say that, you know. And has it been going, you know, all out in every game? But yeah, I thought he played extremely well. He showed what potential playoff LeBron could look like. So, I want to point out from this game that Giannis still had thirty-two points and eleven rebounds. Yeah, he didn't play bad. Like Giannis played well, but does it concern you that Giannis wasn't able to close out this game? Not, not as much Giannis as. Uh, everyone else on his team, like I'm looking at Chris Middleton, you know, he made the all-star game, so why aren't you acting like an all-star? Brooke Lopez isn't no scrub either, so why isn't he contributing as much as he should be? And then everyone else, you know, like er- Eric Bledsoe. Oh, he played so bad. Yeah, like what's up with that, man? Like, you got you got Rajon Rondo guarding you, and he's like 30-something, like he's old. So there's no reason that... You know, nobody else but Giannis should be stepping up. Like, if I'm being honest, if they were, you know, a, a little bit closer, I'd say, or even had the lead, I think Giannis would be able to hold on or be in a position to hold on, but they weren't. And that's just not how that worked out, you know. Giannis didn't play a bad game. It was everyone else around him. And that kind of, you know, we, we don't have to think about it right now, but for future sake, you know, just speculation, it's something to keep an eye on because it doesn't, it doesn't bode well for the Bucks, showing that only one person needs to like step up. I'm more mean, like they're really like centered around Giannis. I mean, know what I'm saying that looms huge for a potential upcoming free agency for Giannis Antetokounmpo. Yeah, and every team in the NBA wants him. Yeah, he doesn't have to stay in Milwaukee, and he doesn't. He really, well, as an OKC fan, I think he should. However, it's a it's a new era of basketball. Sure. With different intentions and different ways of achieving championships or you know, just being handed championships. Kevin Durant. Uh-huh. But you know, that this change of culture is huge to Giannis potentially leaving Milwaukee with I mean, I feel like the Bucks have certainly made moves to try and make this team competitive. Like, we've seen them active at trade deadlines. Sure. But why isn't it translating, I guess? so. Yeah, and maybe, you know, he wants to give them one more year. He signs a really short contract with them. 
But it's not a good look when you lose primetime games like this. It's not a good look where he obviously gave it his all, but there is a lot lacking, a lot to be uh, desired from the rest of the team that wasn't giving his all. And, you know, I'm going to just be real. I mean, the links have been made already, but I think if he was on a Miami Heat team, this would not have happened at all. And this Miami Heat team is looking scary too as well. You know, you have backup players like Goran Dragic. He was never really a scrub, but he's a pretty good, you know, role player. Who are stepping up Duncan Robinson, Jimmy Butler, Bam Adebayo. Uh, like, just everyone, to be honest. Derek Jones Jr. even. And if I'm being honest, like, I definitely see a Miami Heat team competing way better than this Bucks team if they were to play the Lakers. If Giannis was on that team. That is to say. I know I know. I started off by introducing this segment about LeBron, but we can get back to him. Okay, that's fine. I want to talk about this Bucks team a little bit because yeah. they lost this game to the Lakers, and then Giannis missed the next two games. So up to date, they've lost. They're on a three-game losing streak, uh-huh. which is insane because they were on pace to finish with 70 wins. Yeah. And That's they lost to the Suns yeah. without Giannis. And then they lost to the Nuggets, which is a fine loss. And Sure. Okay, like, how concerned are you about about the Bucks? Well, it's showing their weaknesses right now. <laughs> and their weakness is not having Giannis on the floor, which is a pretty big weakness, you know. And I, I get that they want to build around him, but, like, you have to build a team. Also, coach a team like Budenholzer uh, that could compete without him, you know. And those losses weren't even that close either, to be honest. And that's that's a really to big be red Giannis. Fight. Okay. There's another one. <laughs> yeah, uh, Jesse's still here, by the way. <laughs> but yeah, I'm just listening for Cody's puns for the rest of the time now. Yeah. But anyways, uh, it's not a good look because NBA teams are like, all right, great. Let's just <laughs> let's double and triple team Giannis because nobody else is gonna step up. So, offensively or defensively, if I'm being real, like they could get him out of position. Like, I think coaches should be paying attention, or you know whatever, uh, at at the Bucks of film right now because this is the blueprint to it, you know. And there are plenty of teams that can beat the Bucks. If I'm being honest, not just in the NBA but in the East. I already mentioned it, Miami. If the Sixers could ever figure themselves out, maybe them. Celtics probably. Uh, Raptors probably could too. The Celtics are kind of on a backslide right now, though. They are. They, they lost to the Thunder yes. in Boston. It's not a bad loss either. Though. By missing a last second shot. And they also lost to, I want to say the Hornets. Like yeah. a not, not a good team. but No, not at all. Yeah, I, I do want to point out that the Nuggets also, they beat the Bucks twice this year. Yeah. And one of those games, because, uh, you know, they played without Giannis this time, but last time they played, the Nuggets only had nine players, and Jamal Murray wasn't a part of it. So, yeah. you know, the Bucks, the Bucks can bleed. And I'm going to go off on a quick tangent real quick about the worst charging call I've ever seen in my life. Go for it. So, during the Bucks game, Jamal Murray absolutely destroyed, I think it was Wilson, for the Bucks, and he jumped. The, the defender jumped with Murray to try and block the shot, and Murray just put it to him, and they called offensive charge. But the damage had already been done by that point, honestly, because the stadium got loud. You could hear the fans over the TV, just like the sudden change in volume over what was probably one of the greatest dunks that didn't count, yeah, honestly. I, I saw that, uh, that headline. I mean, the greatest dunk that doesn't count. You saw you saw the dunk, right? I saw Just, the dunk, it was yeah. Insane. It was good. It was so good and definitely odd. wasn't a charge. Definitely wasn't in charge. And Jamal Murray also had a sick crossover three that game. And as a Nuggets fan, it's really good to see Jamal Murray coming back from injury and then being a contributor on this team because that was a question mark for Nuggets fans. Right. Speaking of teams that we root for, root for, Simon how are the Mavs looking? How are you feeling about the Mavs? I'm feeling pretty good. Um, <sighs> yeah, we'll talk about it later. I am feeling good, though. Let's let's just focus on these last couple games. 
Chris Stops has finally, uh, you know, come back to form, and we knew it was going to take a while, right? And he he was playing very well against the Pelicans. That was honestly a really good game, you know, because we had two really young teams. The Pecap, ah, sorry, the Pelicans are definitely not making the playoffs, in my opinion. Um, you know, I think not having Zahn for those couple months really hurt them. And he's he's a force to be reckoned with, you know. He he was one of I think he is the first person to have like ten straight twenty plus point games or something like that. And then he probably holds that uh, that record now for the most twenty points twenty point games as a rookie. He's younger than us too. Yes, and he is younger than us. And so he's he's no joke. Lonzo he's been picking it up too, you know. Uh, in that game against the Mavericks, he was insane from the three and it wasn't like he was shooting wide open shots like there was always somebody or at least one or two people rotated on him when he would make the shot and they were just very clean his shooting form is way better you know it's cleaned up and you know he's he's finally showing off i think i think we all knew he was going to be a good nba player right you know but it was just the offense like he could pass he could play really good defense he could rebound um but really it was just like offensively how consistent could he be and then durability was another one as well. Now he's shooting like over 40% for three. Yes, he's been playing great. And then, you know, Brandon Ingram is probably a most improved player of the year candidate, if not that person. And so the Mavericks played a really good game against them. And it went into overtime and they won. You know, Luka didn't have as great of a three po- as a shooting game, I'd say. But, you know, he has been going through a string of injuries from wrist injuries to thumb injuries. Like, you know, it's a bunch of little, like, stuff that he's kind of playing through right now, including tonight, which is a little concerning to a degree because they're all very, like, small, like, you know, like, knick-knack type of injuries and whatnot. I think he'll be fine either way. But this Mavericks team is playing very well. Seth Curry is shooting out of his mind right now. So there's that. Um, Maybe with Steph returning to the Golden State lineup, he's going to siphon the Curry power away from Seth. Maybe, but even then, we don't need him to do a lot. He's not even a starter for us. You know, Tim Hardaway Jr. has been playing good when called upon. Uh, Yeah, I mean, and then we have a really good, I think we have a really good bench, to be honest. Like, I really like Willie Cauley-Stein. He's been playing great when we throw him in there. You know, Maxi Kleba has been having a really good season as well. Um... Definitely a defensive player of the year candidate, in my opinion, as he's pretty high up there in blocks per game and steals per game. So there's that. Michael Kidd Gilchrist, he doesn't need to play offense for once. You could literally put him on anybody and he would shut them down and that's it. And it's okay, you know, because we have plenty of shooters. So I think this Mavericks team is built to last. I don't think this year is their season just because, you know, there's, there's some injuries that are building up that are a little... You know, concerning, I'd say. Like Luca, he I think he's still adjusting to a full eighty two game season, which is why you could see a little bit of wear and tear, you know, and then Chris stops like obviously they're not gonna play him in back to back games unless you know, unless it unless he wants to or it's like a really big primetime game where he feels like he needs to, because that's happened too before. So yeah. What was that stat you told me about Chris Stapps? Do you remember? Yeah, so he's the first person since Shaq in like a four or five game span, something like that, to average like 30 plus points per game, five plus blocks per game, and then 10 plus rebounds a game. And that happened all last week. So New York Knicks, Chris Stapps is back. Yeah. This is basically the conclusion that we come to from Chris Stapps' latest performances. Yeah, remember when Knicks fans thought that they robbed us, the Mavericks? Yeah. That was never true. Because DeAndre Jordan's not even on the team anymore, and DSJ doesn't even start or yeah, get the minutes. The Knicks are really bad. Yeah, and that's because of James Dolan. But yeah, I, I think the future of this Mavericks team is, you know, it's looking really bright. This season, at least, it's going to be entertaining to watch. In the future, though, you could see them contending for sure. Because I think, if I'm being honest, they have everything they need right now. I think adding a third star would kind of screw up the chemistry because... At this point, you just got to lean on Luka and Porzingis and then role players like Seth Curry, Tim Hardaway Jr., um, Maxi Kleba, Willie Cauley-Stein will take care of the rest because those are all guys, in my opinion, who could probably average double digits in our system. Half are. So, yeah. 
Good take. Good update on the Mavericks. By the way, the Mavericks beat the Nuggets. Yes. On today, March 11th. Um, I say the last takeaways is the last thing we're going to talk about is LeBron and the Lakers beating the Clippers. Yep. In the Battle of LA. This game, just like any game between these two LA teams this year, really big with uh, postseason implications. And LeBron showed out, and a surprise showing, I think, from Avery Bradley. Yeah, he played great. For the Lakers. Um, I The Lakers just outplayed the Clippers, and, you know, I feel like Paul George really isn't playing up to expectations for the Clippers this year. Mm-hmm. Uh, did you have any thoughts on this game and... Uh, I guess what it looks like for the future of LA, like who's LA's team? I guess. I mean, LA's team will always be the Lakers. I think. <laughs> I, I mean that sucks, but that's just how it is. You know, LA is an over, you know, overly saturated market. You know, even if people show up, that doesn't mean that they're going to be loyal to your team. You know, and I think that's important for uh, people to know that. You know, I think. Their owner knows that, which is why he's looking at, you know, getting in, you know, buying, uh, ironically, the Lakers' old uh, stadium before the Staples Center, you know, back from MGM. And then that would give them, you know, their actual own home field advantage. And if I'm being honest, it wouldn't help. It would help them moving away from LA, too. Just to, you know, uh, put some distance because they're never going to be LA's team. The Lakers have, like, at least, they have way too many championships. The only way for them to be LA's team is for them to win way more championships than the Lakers, and soon. And so, the Lakers definitely showed that, you know, they're here to play. I think the Clippers were holding back a bit. Like, they were letting Patrick Beverly go one-on-one with LeBron, who did famously say that it was easy to guard LeBron, even though he got bodied all game. So, well, Patrick <laughs> so that's Beverly's. That. Uh, interesting bad player who's sure who always has played dirty and you know thinks he's better than he is but I sure. guess half of his game actually 90% of his game is confidence so good for him I guess yeah I mean he still gets paid and gets to live in LA so that's that but yeah, makes more money than me even though I could probably do the exact same things he does me too just be annoying me too but yeah anyways uh, it's not panic mode for the Clippers. They'll be okay. I think they they got what they wanted from the Lakers. They see what they're doing, you know, in these last couple games that they have played up head to head against each other, and you know they'll keep that in mind for the playoffs. Does that do it for this part of NBA? Yes, it does. If you're wondering why we sometimes hesitated talking about. The future, and we didn't preview more teams. Stay tuned for the next segment on the biggest headline from March 11th in sports. Welcome back to the Cycle 365. Potentially the last episode ever. Just kidding, it's not, because we're recording for the future on Friday when this episode comes out, I think. But anyways, uh, the coronavirus has hit, and in a major way, it seems like every day that it's getting worse. And uh, let's let's start, just start with this. It's, it's personal, right? So our university has basically canceled classes. I mean, not, not these next two days, though. But once they get back from spring break, UNC is going to be doing online classes for the next two weeks. Everything will be open still, like the dorms, dining halls, and literally everything else. <laughs> but classes um, and university events will well, be canceled as well. Yeah, I was about to say, it, they're just trying to decrease foot traffic. Yes, basically. which is a big point. Uh, which also leads to the other point. CSU is doing the same thing, along with CU, and then Colorado Johnson College, and Johnson and Wales. TCU. TCU. Pretty much all of the universities are doing this. Yes, it is. And since I have inside information, I know on the high school level, 
school districts as well are, um, I mean, their plans have been updated and they are waiting on the CDC to, uh, to basically tell them what to do next, you know, because it's up to them. So, let's just be real. You know, well, actually, let's define the coronavirus and what it is, right? Symptoms, what are they? They're basically, it's basically, the, yeah, basically the, the common flu. I'm not saying it's the common flu. The symptoms are basically the common flu. Yes. Fever, coughing, scratch throat, it shortness is, of breath. It is told, or to what we know, if you're having s serious trouble breathing, that's when you should probably go seek medical attention medi just medical to attention. be tested for coronavirus. To be tested yes. for coronavirus. If you just have normal flu symptoms, you could just have the normal flu. Yeah. Yeah, but that's what makes it tricky, though, because mm -hmm. a lot of people, especially, you know, I'll, I'll just put it out there, you know, maybe older people who are a little bit more stubborn uh, might just think it's just the flu. But this is definitely something you could die from if you're not careful enough. And let's, you know, let's 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 go by the facts, you know, yeah. elderly people and uh kids and then people with immune system problems are the ones most at risk. So basically, the, they're the. I'm not going to say the only ones, because we don't know that yet. You have a significantly degree. higher chance, if your immune system is weaker, being older, dif disorder, or a kid. And I will of say, dying. I will, dying. I will say, of dying, not, I, would, I don't want to go that sinister sure. and say of dying. I would say you just have a more potential risk of it being more severe. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, we'll say that. And that, that's fair. Okay. Um, but the biggest deal, like the thing why everyone is worried is because, you know, say it mutates and that's worst case scenario you know we're not trying to incite anything well uh, the but, reason that well, it's an issue right now is because it spreads so easily mm -hmm. and there's no cure for it and there's not a cure for it yet but just the fact you can have it for two weeks and show no symptoms of it mm -hmm. and still spread it to other people mm -hmm. you can it can be transferred it's, it can be airborne it can be transferred through handshakes it's it's really simple how easily it can be transferred yeah. Something to keep our audience calm Go is the it. number of recovered cases is way yeah. higher than the cases for death. Yeah. By by I would say 90 98%. Yeah, absolutely. At least. <laughs> absolutely. It's a really it's re the re rate of recovery is really high. We're not saying you know necessarily as an individual you should be worried about it. However, you need to be conscious of good hygiene yeah. and who you're interacting with because you <clears throat> can spread it to somebody who's more likely to have a severe reaction. Just, just wash your yeah. hands. Yeah, pretty much everything at this point are preventive measures. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah that's it. We're going into quarantine mode to not spread it more. That's yes. that's the issue right now is yeah. not spreading it. Because mm -hmm. if things do go bad really quick, which there's always a possibility of that, then, I mean, it's it's already game over by that point, right? You know? Let's, let's but that's why the game. Over. I know, I know, I know. I'm just saying though. But like, that, I'm being real. That's why we're doing this, right? Yeah. Because like, you can't quarantine and like take all these precautions while it's happening. I mean, you can, but what's the point if there's not a cure? So that leads us into all the news that is yeah. coming out. So I was gonna say, let's, let's tie this together. It's, this is a sport sports podcast. So let's yeah. let's talk about how coronavirus is affecting sports and not just a single sport. The whole sport industry. Yeah, of course. I mean, it, it's affecting the world, so it's affecting sports. Uh, let's go in chronological order, though. So Italy, very early on, it was a couple weeks ago, um, they canceled all sporting events. One, okay, they didn't. Sorry, they didn't. Well, actually, yeah, they did because fans they, can't go. They played in front of no fans, though. Yes, which is, I mean, you know, the definition of canceling could vary. But yeah, uh, basically the games did happen, right? And you know, you could still watch them uh, via stream, but fans weren't allowed to go. And that's been happening for a couple weeks now. You know, and that's that's a really big impact. And in particular, we're talking about Italy sports, basically just soccer, professional league soccer. Yeah, because which, that's- Which has premier league teams. Yes, yeah. only yes. I'm not yeah. saying it's small. I'm just saying like, when we talk about Italy Specific sports, sports, it's yeah. soccer. In yeah, because a lot of fans do go to those games. Yeah, so it's, like, it's big time. I yeah. mean, soccer's huge in Europe yeah. for them. Yeah, and so that's very dangerous. And so they were, I would say, probably the first, you know, um, sport-related thing to to happen as in relation to coronavirus, I'd say. 
you know, and then it kind of just spiraled out of control. Do y'all want to add on to that? Starting with actually starting with the soccer players. Well, let's let's just talk about Italy okay. for a second. Yeah. So, you know, they allow no fans at the games. First yeah. off, we find out that a manager coach has coronavirus, so that obviously raises red flags, yeah. right? And then we found out today or yesterday that one of the defenders today. for Italy, for an Italian soccer team, has coronavirus. And if you've ever been an athlete, you know that high-fiving your teammates and celebrating with your teammates and sharing a locker room with your teammates is a part of sport culture. Mm -hmm. So now all of those fellow teammates and opposing teams and coaches and stuff are going to be tested. Yeah, and uh, for that, it wasn't some scrub. Uh, I shouldn't say that. That's kind of mean. But it really wasn't some scrub like soccer team. It was Juventus, which is the same team that Cristiano Ronaldo plays for right now. And, <clears throat> yeah, that is extremely concerning because they kind of just found that out. They really did just find that out today. March and 11th. March 11th, right. And, they, you know, that whole ban went in effect two weeks ago. And so the last game they played, I want to say, was in March as well. Mm. So there's that. And this has led to now, as of today, again, today, we're recording and it just happened to be that today, March 11th, is when it all went down. They have completely canceled the Italian soccer league. Yep. It is not yes. being played anymore. Yeah. And that's also... That was because of the case of the players. Yes. Yeah, it yes. is. Yeah, that, that's what I'm saying. That's yeah. what it has led to. And also, this is, it's just a side note, but a German soccer player was uh, diagnosed with the coronavirus as well today, kind of around the same time. So, soccer in general is, I mean, actually sports in general, that kind of just leads us into our next thing, is uh, is on pause for now. So, let's let's talk about everything else that's happened. Cause, in America. Yeah. Coming back to America where it's catching up now. Back in America, the biggest headline, or one of the biggest headlines is today, the NBA is on hiatus right now. They had a owner's meeting today to discuss whether to... Basically, there are two options, play games without fans or just stop the season where it is right now and figure out what to do next. And they ended up going with the latter, where NBA is put on pause right now. And tell us why. And it's because of the coronavirus. Specifically, one game was impacted far more than others tonight, and that was the Utah Jazz at the OKC Thunder game. So, for those who don't know... Rudy Gobert thinks he's super duper hilarious, and while mocking the idea of getting the coronavirus by touching all, intentionally touching all the microphones, and intentionally trying to meet and touch as many people's hands as possible, he contracted the coronavirus, and now all the players for the Utah Jazz and staff and Oklahoma City Thunder are quarantined in Chesapeake Arena. Right now. Right now. They, they're, stu they're stuck there, and they're getting tested, and Rudy Gobert was initially ruled questionable with an illness, which he said was a flu, but it turns out it was coronavirus because he wanted to crack a joke. And, you know, there was a lot of talk going into this about the t potential implications, and the NBA is planning on losing, and I, I read this to ESPN today, hundreds of millions of dollars yeah. with... A, I mean, initially, it was the first news that broke out was that the Nets and Golden State would not play in front of a crowd because of a San Francisco precaution put in that of no public gatherings over a thousand people. Mm -hmm. Now that game's not going to happen at all because the NBA has put a pause on everything with the coronavirus and um, how easily it's the spread. whole NBA season. Yeah, yeah make it's, that clear. And so it, no games are going to be played. No, no, no games are going to be played for the foreseeable future. We still have to see what's going to happen. But as of now, just I, I I would assume that they're not going to play a 2020 NBA championship, which or obviously playoffs or well obviously playoffs. But I mean like the, this may be one of those things where you look back through the record books, you know, and it says no champion crowned in 2020, and you know your kids are gonna ask what the heck happened in 2020 and be like oh let me tell you about the coronavirus, Billy. So. Mm -hmm. I'm just you know, going to say the Mavericks won the championship since they're the last team to win. <laughs> Good. 
Good for Boban, MVP <laughs> of the NBA season, I guess. Yes. But this is huge. Simon, I believe... Or, I don't remember who told me this, but the voter, the owners came to basically a full-out consensus about putting the season on hiatus. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, who was uh, the one who didn't vote to do the right thing? This is just for future records, you know. Whether everything is fine or not, let's, let's just say. So this isn't who a surprise it? to anybody. Yeah. Who but was it? the one owner who voted to play games normally. Not, not even, like, play them in front of empty fan bases, but just continue with business as usual was James Dolan, owner of the New York Knicks, who's done such a good job and has won the people's heart as a great owner. What a just guy. Just once again shows that he doesn't <clears throat> care about anybody but himself. That's a whole new level of uh, selfishness. <laughs> and I just, I don't know how you could be the only guy that... Votes again. I mean, honestly, that'd be the equivalent of UNC being the only school that stays open in all of Colorado. Yeah, no matter <laughs> what. So, you know, <clears throat> that says a lot about the next organization, and I feel like, you know, there's there's a lot of questions, and there's no answers right now, kind of like the in, coronavirus in general. In most sports, too, and it's not just in the NBA. Yep. So, Jesse, you go ahead and tell us about yep. a couple of other sports that are being impacted um, by the Chromebooks. Yeah, I just want to first say, overall, you mentioned money situation that of what NBA is going to lose. Mm-hmm. All sports industries are going to lose tons of money yes. with this, just overall, yes. because of what's happening. But I'll move into, on the basketball subject, the NCAA. Um, so that's March, I mean, we're in March, so March Madness is, is supposed to happen it, in this month. <laughs> right. But they, the coronavirus obviously affecting this. We'll start, again, chronologically. It came first that the Ivy League just completely canceled their their tournament, the Ivy League tournament, um, on Monday, that was? Yeah. yeah. Um, so Yale won- Yale was the regular season winner, so if they do have the NCAA tournament, March Madness tournament, Yale will be going. But they did not play the tournament. Um, and moving forward, conference tournaments will be played. They will be played, but with no fans in attendance. Yes. So for our UNC Bears, they're playing tomorrow. Wait, hold up. Are they? I I heard it was just Big Ten and Big Twelve as of right now, because they've been but having all the of, tournament. All of March Madness will have no. Fans. The actual bracket will have no fans. Yes. So not yes. not like you know, sorry, conference tournaments. All of them at least, because I know Big Sky still has. I mean, they might do it tomorrow. Like be like, hey, no fans, but. If I'm being real, it's a little bit too late. We're halfway I think, through. I think the Big Sky tomorrow, at least, granted, semifinals and finals on, yes. fr- on Friday and Saturday might be different, but I think tomorrow there will be fans at the games. Yeah. Um, mainly say. because it's also in, in Boise, Idaho, and nothing's really happening up there right now. I mean, there is yeah. cases up there, though, at the same time. Oh, I know. Well, Seattle's right there, so, I mean, yeah. Yeah. It, it's definitely a possibility. And there's some teams coming from the Eastern Washington is playing there tomorrow, so, I mean. Oh, God. Yeah, so. <laughs> um, there Eastern are, yeah. Washington but anyways, is about to. I do, think, I do think that there will be fans there tomorrow. Maybe something different comes about on Friday and Saturday for the uh, semifinal championship. But, yeah. anyways, being said, UNC, our UNC plays tomorrow, Southern Utah. Two seed versus seven seed. Yeah. It's a little scary because that's exactly what it was last year. I know that's and what we I was lost. Thinking. But let's <laughs> let's move forward. Let's, let's move, move forward. forward. Yeah. So in our NCAA tournament, if they even have it, I still think they'll have it. But if they have the Mark Madness tournament, no fans will be in attendance. Nope. Except for family, right? And mm-hmm. then essential personnel. So like I'm coaching staff. I mean, they're still not. They're trying not to have over like a hundred people in the stadium. No. They're going to have more than 100 if all the families come. Yeah. I'm going to say they're going to try and cap it at probably 500, yeah. I would say. There might be basketball teams that will be watching. That might really be the only – which will be an interesting dynamic for sure. Especially – me and Cody were talking about earlier today. It could, it could really favor the underdogs 100% because, again, like you said earlier when yes. we were talking about the Dragons at the uh, Wildcats, it's just going to come down to who is a better team at basketball. Yeah. Who's better basketball team? Yeah. And I think like a team like UNC can go in and probably beat a team like San Diego State. Oh yeah. You know, San Diego State, they were favored to be a number one seed. Ended up probably gonna end up being a number two or number three seed now. 
but they really ran off their fan base and the electric the electricity in their stadium. They went undefeated in their stadium or in their arena. Yeah. But without fans there, it's it's I don't know if they're that good. Yeah, it showed when Utah State beat them. Yeah. So that's not an indication of something. But um, I also think a team like UNC yeah. can beat Utah State. I think that's a oh, easy win too. Yeah, easy. I think I think and we go back to it, I'm sure we talked about it earlier, but um UNC is one of the teams that not only us as as a podcast have been like looking at, but they've been getting na- national recognition as a team that could be, even with fans there, a high powered Gonzaga one, two, three seed team. Yeah. So I mean well so bringing it back, at this point the reason why uh you know we're a bit more optimistic of UNC if there is a March Madness tournament, you know, moving forward is because of the lack of mood swings, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, in sports, in all sports, you know, it's not just football, you know, but in all sports there are mood swings and um, energy swings for sure. And so, I mean, this is just a side note, you know, but it's very interesting to see how this March Madness will be, you know, assuming that there is going to be one. Just because, you know, it's team versus team, right? You got your coaching staff versus another coaching staff. and Your you know, players versus other players. Yeah, yeah. So, like, which which... You know, squad is going to be best. Which squad is going to be most composed? There's really no fans outside of, like, possibly other basketball teams, you know, your own staff and some family members, which at that point you've been playing in front of, like, years of anyways, you know, because you're college basketball players. I'm currently taking applications to be a part of some team's uh, family members because I will (laughs) produce a lot of noise. A lot of noise, and uh, I can electrify an arena. So... If uh, any basketball coaches are listening to this, so that that kind of does it for. But hold on, I gotta say one more thing. Okay, there's well, a little bit more. As we talked about, as you said though, with no, like we are, there's just so many unknowns. I will say now, there still is a week to two weeks. Well, I mean, selection Sunday is this Sunday. Yeah. But so maybe a little bit more than a little bit less time than I thought. But who knows? Within two weeks, the coronavirus could be contained. And you could reopen it. Like probably not going to happen. But I'm saying those are the unknowns we don't know. Or the whole tournament could be canceled. Cancel. Yeah. So we they, just don't know yet. With with the league like the NBA canceling its season, it's I certainly feel like it's going to have a domino effect. And I feel like even with like the Big Ten and the Big Twelve closing off their tournaments, that's going to have a domino effect as well. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. So it definitely could. Well, yeah. We just there's just the unknowns moving forward. In all of this, in all sports, with the coronavirus. Because like I said, it could be contained in two weeks, and everything is reopened to normal. Everything could be canceled. There could be zero sports in two weeks. Yeah. So I mean, we just don't know. At this point, it's trending towards that, though, because, you know, NBA is a big league, right? March Madness is a huge thing. The NCAA will lose millions. And we know how greedy they are, mm-hmm. you know, and how critical of everyone is of them. But in their so, statement, they said that their student-athletes' health was the most important thing. Yeah, sure. But... That's the thing, though. If I think it's very eye-opening to see the NCAA like basically cancel March Madness on their fans because that's how they make money. Yeah, March so, Madness. Is, yeah, March Madness is one of the biggest revenue generators. Oh yeah, okay, for the NCAA. So Go for ahead. like the rest of like sports in general, you know, like sports leagues and whatnot, that puts a lot of pressure added with the NBA. That puts a lot of pressure on them to to act sooner than later and take, you know serious precautions, whether it may be an overreaction or not, to uh, containing the coronavirus. I mean, Jesse, you yep. have I'm also another gonna, sport. I'm also going to touch on baseball with, I mean, opening day is within two or three weeks of us now yeah. for baseball. Um, and a team like the Seattle Mariners, so like that would be where you could say, unfortunately, where coronavirus started in America would be Seattle. Um, like, like, well, like the first case? No, not the first case, but just like where we really got eye open to, oh, the coronavirus can kill people. Well, that's, I'm pretty sure that's where the first case was too. Granted, whatever, oh. whatever it is, Seattle, the Seattle Mariners, so the professional baseball team in Seattle, canceled their first seven, their first homestand, their first seven home games, including opening day. They're just not even playing. Yeah. So, I mean, like, that's big time. <laughs> like, here's another big time league, I mean, professional baseball. Just completely saying we're not going to play these games. But and it's and it's been around. I mean, like the NBA is old, but baseball is even older. Part of yeah, it's part of the, like history of this country. And mm-hmm. for them to recognize it like that and just cancel their games. An opening game, yeah. Because like 
opening day, day like tradition. Opening day America, around really? America is huge. Like oh, everyone's yeah. watching, whether you're a baseball fan or not, you're watching opening day. Yeah, when you hear about it, or yeah. it's on the radio. Like. Yeah. So that's the other update about about NBA or sorry MLB the uh, baseball. Seattle Mariners will not play their first home stands. The first seven home games are canceled, completely canceled. No. So. Yeah, I mean, did you have anything you wanted to add to that, Cody? I mean, I would like to point out that NBA, MLB, NFL, NHL, they have cross like um, they have like cross crossing committees, yeah. And so they're all talking to each other. So we see one like the NBA make a big move. It could be a domino fall mm-hmm. real quick, but. I think I think the only thing that we can talk about is because I mean all the sports are going on except for the NFL. So I think the NFL kind of got lucky and they're on the back burners right now, sitting back just watching all that because they got nothing going on right now. Yeah. But free agency is coming up. Exactly. So we'll That's see. a lot of traveling. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we'll see. Maybe hopefully free agency doesn't get closed, but <laughs> yeah, it'll be uh, interesting for sure. Also, this is just a side note, but pretty sure Trump put a child travel ban on yes. people coming from Europe. Yeah. And so, I mean, I'll just be... That impacts me personally because I know people who are in Europe right now um, trying to get their degrees. And they were supposed to come back this week. And I don't know. But other than that, if we're talking about athletes and players for sure, uh, that's going to be a really big deal. You know, obviously NBA draft is not too far away. You know, you want to always scout and whatnot. So that will affect scouting over there indefinitely. Uh, soccer as well, indefinitely. You know, and I mean, you know, not as much really football, but, you know, it's, it's a growing thing. But basically, we could just say right now that nobody international is going to get drafted into the NFL because that's just how the NFL is. So that's going to be a really big hit on the development of uh, football outside of the U.S. as of right now. So I think those are all things just to keep in mind. And speaking of football, uh, so we're going to come to the XFL. You know, so we already talked about how Seattle lost their fan base. Sorry, not lose it. They're, they're helping their fan base out, right? So they're not letting them, I mean, they're just saying that they're not going to play their games with fans there. You know, and that's for their own good. And as of today, March 11th, they are the only team that is doing that. But that could definitely change within the next two days of this podcast getting posted. So forgive us for... Uh, you know, possible late information and whatnot, or information that we may not have yet. So, that's that. And we've already talked about, you know, how it affects games and whatnot, and that's, you know, that's that's a thing, right? But for a league like the XFO to not have fans come to their games, uh, that's a really big hit. Like, seriously, if we're being honest, Two or three weeks of not having fans come in is the equivalent of two or three weeks of lacking revenue. And that might be a death penalty for the XFL before it even starts. Because it is a great you know, product and all that. That's, there's a reason why we're still talking about it right now in depth. You know, it's, it's big and people love it. But they rely on the fans. Seattle was a big contributor to the revenue as well because they've they've been really consistent with their numbers, you know, consistently hitting the 20,000s and, you know, keeping that number despite their team struggling as well. And now that's one, you know, uh, path of revenue that's just taken away, you know. And this is really going to hurt the XFL because it's not like there's a lot of teams. There are six teams. Oh, oh sorry. There are eight teams. So that means there are four, you know, games going on per week. Already, you're you're taking out a fourth of your revenue for this week, and that's a lot, you know. And so, for a startup league like this, that's going to be a really big hit. And you know, hey, say none of the fans come. The XFL isn't the NBA. It's not the NCAA. It's not the MLB. They don't have money that they could lean back on and be like, all right, yeah, you know, like we could afford to suspend operations, because if the XFL was to do that, then that means their players would stop getting paid. Because that's that's where they get their money, you know. Unless owners are willing to pay out of pocket, which over time is a lot of money. So that's just something to keep in mind for sure. Uh, and it's concerning, you know, because this not. I mean, even if this is just like a fad, or I shouldn't say fad. Even if this is something that's cured in two weeks, 
if they start can- canceling games and what or not allowing fans to come, which is what they should do, in my opinion, uh, to a degree, then, I mean, that that might be it. Three weeks of no revenue is a is a really big, like that's a lot of money to lose for a startup league. You know, it's really hard to imagine the XFL making it through because the AAF we saw what happened to them. Nothing, no crisis even happened for them to fall apart. They just didn't make great decisions, and they're already walking a thin line right there, some thin ice, and they fell apart because they ran out of money. The XFL, you know, they won't have a choice. If I'm being honest, they really won't, and they'll, I mean, they'll lose money. That's money that they can't get back, you know, unless they reschedule it. But even then, that starts conflicting with other things, and there's already other events planned. Like, it's just a big thing, you know. So, I mean, let's just be real. I think we are looking at the impending death of the XFL, whether this coronavirus thing ends up, you know, being cured and everything's fine in a couple weeks, or whether it, you know, worst case scenario. Let's just so. hope the XFL makes it through, because I'll be sad if it dies out. It's not looking good. It's this is, this is a serious thing, and I, I think uh, one thing that I can we can say here from the cycle here at the end is just from the World Health Organization, just some basic measure measures to avoid spreading the coronavirus or getting it. Just to Jesse said it earlier, wash your hands. Always. It's not that big of a deal. You should wash them for like 20 seconds. I've done it twice like two times more than I usually do. Like, Cody, you saw me, right? Before I came down and ate today, I washed my hands. Yeah, and it doesn't, do it. It doesn't take that much time. Mm-hmm. It didn't change your entire day, did it, Jess? No, I was still talking to you and still saying things. Yeah. And so. still even watching the highlights for the XFL while I was watching my hands. Yeah. So, and then another <laughs> another thing is to maintain at least, if you're European, one meter, or if you're American, three feet of distance between people because they cough or sneeze, then that's how close. That's how far like the liquid droplets of the cough. <laughs> oh that's that's the like words it. that the World Health Organization used. The liquid droplets. So, okay. In, liquid in droplets, Colorado so. uh, words, it's one ski length. I saw. That doesn't make a lot of sense. That's definitely but, or something like that. Too long. But go ahead. Well, we do things different here in Colorado. <laughs> You're right. We're the healthiest state in the country. Okay, continue. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Practice respiratory hygiene. So this means cover your mouth when you cough. I feel like everyone should do this anyway, but there's a lot of people that don't do it, and I see it a lot on public transportation. So like, oh my goodness, cover your freaking face. And then, you know, if if you think that you, you know, do some research on your own, of course, but if you feel like you have any of the symptoms, try and figure it out and, you know, get self-quarantine or figure out something. If you can, so that's those are the those are the tips from the World Health Organization. Do your part in fighting coronavirus. I do want to yeah. say one more thing to finish up on XFL. Go for it. And Simon's thing, um, like he said, so Seattle is not going to play. So that's one fourth of the revenue gone for this week. Yes. There is also a game being played in DC, and I could definitely see a place like DC also saying no people coming because it's DC. And the East Coast is. Experiencing it's, yes. some troubles and outbreak right yes. now too. So, I was yeah. also going to say LA is definitely a. They're not playing in LA. They're not playing in LA, but I'm saying LA is a place mm-hmm. that may potentially cancel. Yes, mm-hmm. I'm saying, but I'm saying DC could. I'm saying this immediate weekend coming up, DC could be one of those ones that we say cancel in the next two days, which means half of the revenue would be gone. I still look at places like Tampa Bay probably won't cancel. Fan, I think they'll be all right. I I, th- I don't think it's bad enough there for it to be. As of right now. As of right now. And then the other one is, well, the Guardians. The New York Guardians might yeah, might not happen. I mean, not that a lot of people go to the games anyways, but it's still, <laughs> so that could be, like, it's still New York. Yeah. It's a public gathering of less than 1,000 people because no one shows up. <laughs> but just, 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 to be back yeah. to, just to back to what Simon said about revenue wise is if New York, D.C., and we already have Seattle all gone, that's... 75% of the revenue for this week, yeah. gone. Yeah, you could see, also what sucks is that St. Louis just opened their entire stadium. St. Louis just opened their entire stadium as well, so that's a lot of revenue that they're going to lose out. And I could see St. Louis canceling pretty soon here. Well, the first of case of coronavirus was just found in Mississippi, so yeah. that's not that far from misery. Yeah. But so we'll, we'll have to see. Um, just I just, side note real quick. Oh, go ahead. Tom Hanks has coronavirus along with his wife. 
Sad Forrest Gump. And, uh, I mean, I don't know. It shows that nobody's really immune, to be honest. That's sad. But <laughs> I'm going to try and end the show on a lighter note. Even though sports are collapsing around us, the Cycle 365 it's will strong. still bring you sports coverage. We are healthy and we are ready to go, and we will find ways to talk about sports, no matter what, for you, the listeners. Yep. If we have listeners. Yeah, if you're listening. <laughs> Please, you we tonight. got your back. Yeah. But, all in all, I hope, I hope the XFL makes it through. That's my takeaway from this whole podcast. <laughs> I hope the XFL makes it. I feel, I feel like the oh, wait, NHL what? is probably going to cancel next. Yeah, but I'm just saying I hope yeah, the XFL yeah, yeah, doesn't XFL. fold, have to fold. Honestly, I think it would be smart... If more leagues close, I think it'd be smart if the XFL just stopped the season here and went on a hiatus as well. Because they don't have, like, they don't have the ticket deals that, like, like NBA fans have. So I'm saying they need to, if they make a decision, they need to make it now where they put, they slam on the brakes, pull the e-brake, and then just try and put it on pause as best they can. Yeah, I think, um, just as a side note thing, this is something worth keeping in mind because uh, it can happen, you know. It might come down to the XFL possibly not having fans at their games, but to stay afloat, they might start charging, like, certain, you know, like people to watch their games online because that could definitely be a thing. Like, they might just straight up pull, you know. I don't think they would. It would be a real gutsy move that may or may not work, but they might just straight pull their deals if they can, and then try to charge fans to watch online, just to, but even, because I know there's some, like, you know, uh, traction there, you know, like, there's definitely a solid following, and I don't think that would be a great idea, but that's a pretty, that's something that's worth, you know, just keeping in mind, like, as a last-ditch effort, because if you're going, if your ship's already sinking, you know, you gotta, I mean, everything's on the table by that point. Yeah. So... So, um, the future of sports is a question mark, but... At least for this year. For right now, yeah. But, hey, stay tuned to the, the cycle. We're going to bring it to you. We're going to bring you yeah. what happens and, and keep you up to date. Yeah. If there's no sports, then, you know, we have a ton of fun off-season topics that we've been looking forward to for a long time. So, yeah, stay we're tuned. still going to come to y'all either way. <laughs> yeah, All so right? stay tuned to the cycle for next, next week. I'm Cody Stoffer. Simon Voyanos. And I'm Jesse Boone. All right, we'll catch you all next week.